uh, which was obviously a huge pleasure. And um, played at three Olympic Games from Winnipeg and now basically coach goalies slash young athletes, um, as well as older women. So I just signed, I just did a, um, a practice last night for uh, women that are heading over to France to play, but they're all in their 50s and they all started in their 40s. So that was a lot of fun teaching them to do a breakup and everything. So anyways, um, that's me. Hi, welcome to the group. That's really interesting. Picked it up late in life and going to go play some hockey overseas. Yeah, so fun. They really love it. It's the it's the largest growing segment of a hockey in Canada right now is women over 30 that didn't get a chance to play growing up. So it's really fun to participate in their journey to loving the game. Yeah, I'd love to dig into what that's like in teaching adults maybe over children, because obviously adults have like a, a larger life background to pull from. Mm -hmm. And they're just so appreciative because they never had any coaching, you know, so just anything that you tell them is like magic to them. Like I taught them to put their skate blade on the boards when somebody was rimming it and that it comes out to their stick and it was like whoo, magic. Awesome. Greg, uh, I mentioned to you when you did the podcast, your podcast with me that Sammy Joe is somebody who you would really enjoy having on. But I'll, Greg, I'll just get you to explain to introduce yourself to Sammy, if you wouldn't mind, please. Also, I heard the podcast. It was really great. And Wally, thank you for all the really kind comments. That was really nice. OK, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So uh, Greg Revac, I'm here in Ohio in the States, just moved to Columbus, home of the Blue Jackets. I was up in Cleveland, grew up in that area. Um, coached and still do more so on like player recruitment for University of Akron. But the big thing I do now is the podcast uh, and then my newsletter off of that. Both are Hockey IQ. So Hockey IQ newsletter, Hockey IQ podcast, uh, and just writing about the game. And uh, that all started basically after being frustrated, finding concepts or pieces on things I wanted for my players and just couldn't find. So I started writing about it for my players. And then I was like, yeah, I might not be the only one who might enjoy this. Uh, so then I turned it into a newsletter and, and I wanted to talk about these things. And that's where the podcast came from. Well, I, I wanted to uh, thank Greg for the opportunity to get on, but I guess I have to credit Daryl for setting up the contact. I don't know how that worked out, but Greg, you, you might, um, you know, Daryl was one of your guests and Daryl's been on twice with us. And it was our, our connection. My connection with Daryl goes back to the late 70s and early 80s when he was taking coaching clinics at the time. I was heavily involved in working for Hockey Canada. And I didn't realize this until um, much later. He worked with Tim and I on the national team as a skills coach. We knew each other really well, but I never realized the impact on him that those years in the 70s and 80s and early 90s, of they were sort of the pioneering years of development in Canada with uh, Dave King in particular and a number of others who wrote materials for the sports governing body and produced videos. But when uh, Daryl came on, I remember the first session we were all a little nervous. He had written a book, and he was quite famous, as you know. Uh, and we didn't know how long he would stay on, but he got hooked. It was Once he started, he could hardly get off, even though he went for a COVID shot. I think he stayed on during his drive, and he closed out the three hours with us as the day ended. And he told me today, uh, I talked to him on the phone twice since coming back from Toronto, he says it should be a hell of a shark session because it was a unbelievable sharks week. And the only thing I can say, <clears throat> there are no dead sharks in the Toronto Maple Leaf organization. Everybody's breathing, swimming, moving forward and learning. And I've never felt so respected, trusted, been able to talk to anyone at any level in any capacity sharing ideas and it was authentic it wasn't just you know when i went out there i thought oh geez what's going on and uh, Haley pulled it off she's really in the organization at a senior role of senior development 
as well as practicing medicine as a doctor. I don't know how she does it, but as you all know, Haley, she's no human being could bite off as much as she chews. It's amazing. But her role in the organization is it's really interesting. And uh, knowing Daryl and having worked with Daryl over a number of years, that personally for her development, it's led to their connection with many elite athletes. And now it's all come full circle to the Toronto Maple Leafs, where Haley's practicing, uh, com completing her medical practice. And Danielle Goyette has already joined the group, who Haley coached, and Danielle also played with Sammy on the Olympic team. So it was just an amazing week. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't know where to start. So I don't know if any of you have any questions, but uh, I'm... Good to take them. Uh, I went in, and the very first day, Daryl said, you've got to come in early. I want to introduce you to some people. So I didn't know, you know, you're going in, and you don't know what role a skills coach or a <clears throat> developing coach is, but I do know that he has hired, uh, the Leafs have hired uh, 10 full-time people to work with coach development. So that means Daryl's group of 10 people, uh, many of them from the state side that he's worked with over the years. And in particular, the, uh, the junior team, the Chicago Steel, is sort of the template of the way he's coaching and developing. And it's setting up fairly high standard. <clears throat> but I went in, first person he introduced me to was Kyle Dubas and, and uh, you know, Kyle was really polite and, and just said, I'm glad you're here. We're, we're going to learn. And I told him outright, I said, I'm going to learn a hell of a lot more than anybody else. And I guarantee you, I did. Uh, it was such an experience. And from there, <clears throat> the picture with uh, I shared with you with Morgan Riley and Daryl, uh, we went down, ran, ran into some Leaf players and, and he introduced me to them and having a coffee. And just before Morgan Riley came to that photo, um, I had watched Daryl and Haley run a practice with the uh, Leafs, and they ran all the practices with the Leafs. So Danielle, Daryl, and Haley would run the practices, and their 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 methodology. What do you want to do? You want to do the same thing? Do you want to do something different? And I came away there from thinking that's the way I would coach the NHL. The American League team, that's where I would tell a little bit more. But, and Haley agreed with me. I said, Haley, you know, what, what you're doing, um, I don't know what to say, what I could say to them. So they really don't say anything. They ask, and they, it's embraced. The <clears throat> impact of their program is a result of the best players getting better. And if they get better, they want your services, and that's why they're there. The best players value it, and it's rippled through the organization with Sheldon Keith, the head coach, who is all and all three teams' coaching staffs who are connected, similar in philosophies, open learning, and they're embracing the use of coach development with the services of that group of 10 people. So it's it's absolutely amazing. Anyway, I told Daryl the story of when uh, Morgan walked by, I, he didn't introduce me, and I, I said, you know, I had a video of him when he was in the Super Series as an 18-year-old, and he's a shadow of himself. He was so good then, I... I I, I edited that video, and I also did one of Tavares. I didn't mention it then, but just how good he was. And so when he came back through for a, to, to, a game, and he, he introduced me to him, he said, tell the story. tell Wally, tell him your story. And I did. I ended up, you know, his face lit up when I talked about the uh, clip, all the things that he did in it. It was one of those X and O clips trying to, be a complete hockey player and promote that. And he was an example. 
So Haley ended up sending it to him and the coach development staff. And later in the week, uh, we watched all the players practice, and I watched Tavares, and um, he, I have a, a number of clips of him, and one of them I would have to say is the greatest shift ever of any player I've ever seen. So I shared that with Haley, and she sent it to him and the development staff later. So that was sort of the kind of thing that went on. And, the, you know, I, I could have gone on the ice, but I didn't. I just wanted to watch and ask questions. And, in fact, when we were introduced uh, the first evening, um, everybody, Angela James was there as well, you know, brought in by Haley for a different perspective. And I... The first thing I mentioned on the first night was how pleased I was with the openness of the organization. And I said, the most important thing you've done is bring these women in because they're providing emotional intelligence to the organization, which they may have had before these people being present, but now it's been taken to another level. So it was just an incredible week. I watched the big boys practiced when they were there and it was mainly smaller group sessions and you saw some of the videos of that. I watched Daryl's three practice plans, which uh, I will share with you and they're not detailed, but they're progressively building on his concept of applying thinking to the tactical execution at high speed. And I watched the American League coaching staffs run the practices of the two teams that were going to compete to see who would be invited to the uh, main camp of the American League. And the practice was off the chart. I, I could just see the performance of the players and the thinking and the speed and the tempo and the way they played as a way nobody else is playing yet. And I think they're going to set the bar moving forward. So... There's a million things that could happen, and I'm I'm going to edit a little bit of a lot of the photographs and a little bit of the video and put it up at some point in time just for everybody's sake. But I really do believe the um, they're on to something here, and it's the biggest uh, hockey organization in the world that's investing dollars in a good way on growing the game. So anybody, Sammy, you have your hand up? Go ahead. Yeah, just and after Sammy goes, we should let Tom and Kim introduce themselves to Greg. But go ahead, Sammy. Um, they can certainly introduce themselves first if you'd like. Then I can ask the question. Sure, oh. that's that's good. So Kim, Kim and Tom, we've got a, a new a new shark on. Greg's in down in Ohio. He's got a podcast he does on hockey and coaching, but Tom and Kim, go ahead and introduce yourself. Ladies first. Mm. I don't get called that often, but I'll take it. Uh, mm. Hi, Greg. I'm Kim. Uh, I'm a coach here in Toronto. I run a business called Total Female Hockey. As you can see from my outfit, my favorite color is orange. Um, played with Sammy, coached by Tim and Wally at some point back in the day. Um and I'm um, the director of hockey operations for Leaside Girls Hockey, which is a big hockey organization here in Toronto. And I have three small children, so uh, they will likely come in at some point during this call. So don't be alarmed. Yeah, I'm Tom Malloy, and I coach the uh, women's hockey team at SAIT. It plays in the Alberta Colleges League. And I'm in shock right now. We just got shut down again. The whole campus is shut down, and uh, while they meet and see what's happening, I've, I've brought in girls from all four Western provinces, two from Japan, Northwest Territories, Yukon. You know, most of them are 18, like I think they got 16 first years. So uh, I'm trying to find out if I can play, you know, frisbee football or soccer or something with them, or if we just can't have any contact. So that's kind of what I was dealing with so far today because it's just a great group, but uh, that's who I am. Nice to meet you, Welcome, Tom. Welcome, Greg. Yeah, thank you. 
Uh, we actually uh, had shut down last year with the University of Akron club team here in Ohio, and we ended up just throwing them in the, the local men's league. So we couldn't do anything through the university, but the rink was still open. We just put them in men's league. Yeah, well, they just put our ice back in for the first time in a year and a half. So it's been in since, like, start of September. So we got really shut down. Yeah, Greg, the whole province of Alberta got shut down. Wow. Okay, much, much more strict than we are. Yeah. <laughs> well, they got, we we're kind of at the rate that uh, Italy was a while ago. Our ICUs are overflowing. Uh, and I listened to a doctor last night from Red Deer, and they're shipping people to Calgary, which is getting overflowed. And then 100% of the people in ICU are unvaccinated. And then we have the unvaccinated people standing outside the hospitals blocking ambulances and chanting, you know, uh, cat-calling doctors and nurses walking into work. It's just absolutely crazy. How, yeah, how's I've your seen son it. there, Bob? What's that? How's your son? Well, he's, he's getting better. I was actually able to see him yesterday for the first time. Um, and I didn't, and I know they've had in the past the, that's the hospital he's in actually, Tom. Uh, I know in the past I've had some problems at the hospital with the people outside chatting and whatnot, but I didn't see that yesterday uh, at all. Uh, they are busy though. Their helicopters are coming and going constantly, taking people elsewhere. And it's not just COVID patients they're taking, they're taking other people that are in serious shape as well because the ICU is full. They've got, um, they actually moved my son out of the ICU and into the cardiac ward because he doesn't need the ventilator anymore. But in the ICU, they've got um, at least two per room now, and they've got people actually in open areas. It's it's jammed. It's it's very, very full, and um, yeah, it's a mess here in Alberta for sure. Bob, are you um, right in Calgary? No, I'm in Red Deer right now. I'm kind of okay. helping out with the grandkids and getting them back and forth to school, and they're both... One's a, one's a hockey player, one's a competitive gymnast, so got to get them back and forth. Um, and I think the rules are a little bit different uh, for different sports from what I can understand. I think the kids are going to be allowed to, 12 and under, I don't think there's really any restrictions, so my grandson's fine there. And with my granddaughters with their gymnastics, they, ju they just have to maintain uh, distance and wear a mask at all times. So I think it's the 18 and overs that are that are going to be mostly affected. I think right now, Tom, if you're an under 18, I think the, the rules are going to be that they have to uh, social distance, wear a mask, except when they're in actual contact uh, playing the game. But yeah, I've got a few 17-year-olds, right? and then the rest are <laughs> So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. There's something about the organizations have to implement mm -hmm implement this program that Alberta is putting out if they put if they implement that then the rules are going to be a little bit different so you I think I think uh, what's going to happen is what I read in the Alberta rule is that if you're double vaccinated you can participate like even in my old man's hockey right. and if you're yeah. not basically you can't now that that yeah I think you are right there actually so I, I just we our athletic therapist, I just asked her to, if she can find out who's double vaccinated. I think they all are because I was yeah. telling them that all in recruiting so, season. And they, so, they're going to have some kind of proof. You know, right. We're, so, how, yeah, we're going to have, I think, the uh, passport, vaccine passport starting Sunday. You can register, I think. But how is this going to affect, um, like, CFL and NHL and whatnot? Are they... You gonna get shut down now? Well, right now it's only in Alberta that the cases are so extreme. So I don't know for the Flames and the Oilers how it will affect them. Yeah, I'm not sure what they're gonna do there. And it may be that, as we're intimating, if you know, if all the players are double vaccinated, maybe there won't be much of a restriction. Yeah, it'll obviously. You know, they've already planned to do 
the Flames have already announced that you need to prove you're double vaccinated to get into the games. Um, so you never know. Well, and, and Columbus let a coach go because he refused to get vaccinated, right? I think it was Columbus. So the NHL is, is obviously making sure that their people are taken care of. Yeah. Well, that happened with at Women's Worlds, too, when Team USA's uh, coach uh, at Women's Worlds, when the male coach didn't want to get vaccinated before Halifax, and then he left the team. Oh, really? Okay. He didn't want to wear a mask on the bench. So that was the big thing. So that's why the, their coach got replaced. I didn't know that. Wally, you're Wally, you're, Wally, you're, you're, I muted you when your phone went off there. So you need to unmute yeah. yourself. Just uh, uh, my, my wife is having some medical problems and they're on the doctor right now with the, she is with the cardiologist. So I may have to leave at any time. Uh, just continue with whatever's going on if I get called away. But uh, at okay, any so rate, Wally, you're going to leave at any time, just so you know, if you want to go be with her. Yeah. But if you are here for a second, I do want to ask my question just quickly um, uh, of you. Um, uh, Bob and Tom, terrible what you guys are going through. Uh, obviously, tough. Um, but I do want to ask Wally about his amazing experience because. All of us on this call uh, are mentor coaches to other coaches as well. And so I want to know what it was like to have people that you mentored and coached coaching professionally in the NHL, especially as women. I mean, that was it's such an amazing feat that these girls are doing it. But for you to see them was were you just so proud? Like, what was your feelings of being there? Well, I don't know. Proud is the word to express it. It's it's. Um... The, it's more relief because <clears throat> watching uh, uh, all three, even Angela James, as they as they walked around and conducted themselves, that organization and everybody they ran into, the players, whether it was Kyle or the GM and the coaches, are seeking them out. It, they're there. They're of value. Their 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 knowledge and ability to share information in in a non intrusive way, but in a welcoming way, um, they're part of it. And I think they're going to be a big part of it in the future. And I did mention I'd be, I'd have a female on the bench and every NHL team in a flip of a heartbeat because there's no egos. They just do things the way they need to be done. And then that's the national emotional intelligence side where guys have to win to have fun, as Tim said, and girls have to have fun to win. So, you know, of course, working with them over a lifetime and then them achieving that position and being asked in, uh, it's really intriguing to watch what's going on. And there were so many little things that happened in terms of Daryl uh, on the last day, uh, there was a, a number of speakers, and Daryl was talking to a gentleman. I went up to the room, came back an hour off later. He's still standing on his feet, and I was getting supper. Sat at that table to watch him as they stood in the same place when I left, and talking Daryl Belfry talk about hockey. And I, Daryl came over. Uh, when the guy had to leave, and I said goodbye, and I said, Daryl, who was he? He said, Well, he's a head of senior professional scouting for the Leafs. And he's he's eating up everything Daryl said. So the scouting team, you know, the, the brass, everybody who has a decision-making responsibility in the organization is buying into the open-ended, lifelong learning, ask the player philosophy, learning from the student philosophy that Daryl embraces. And uh, Daryl brought in um, Haley and Haley brought in Danielle, and they are they're his wingers, and uh, they're they're really providing support for him, but also providing guidance for him because they 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 see the big picture. So I'm I'm totally impressed. Um, when I arrived the first evening. <coughs> 
I had I had to speak. The topic was coaching today because I'm an old guy who keeps up. I, I'm not one of these guys who's old school. And the first thing I, I said uh, complimenting the organization was um, the openness they were and the authentic authenticity they, they, they emulated every day and particularly making me feel so welcome. So finally, uh, I've never felt as good in, you know, all of my years of working as a full-time employee in a school system or in 10 years of working with Hockey Canada. The, 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 there was just never the same degree of, of communication and open-ended uh, dialogue about topics and the respectful reception of what everybody had to say. And that was the most rewarding thing, to do it at this age, at the time of my life. Um, I'm really looking forward to the impact that organization can have on sports in general as they embrace uh, 21st century thinking and coaching and leading, administrating, creating a culture that uh, needs to be, it needs to be done everywhere. Tim? Yeah, uh, thanks, Well, I, I just wanted to sort of, you know, you'd already, uh, obviously already mentioned how impressed you were with their, sort of their level of thinking or progressive thinking, but there were there one or two other sort of takeaways that, that you would have uh, outside of that sort of global philosophical um, observation, which is a important one and a good one, obviously, but what, what would be one or two things after that? Well, I'm going to separate the X's and O's because without them doing what they're doing, the X's and O's, which are at a different level than what we've even talked about. It, it's phenomenal that we um, letting the you know, and it's the elite players. They all think the game better than we do. We've played it. We've coached it in a different era. But they've been coached by coaches we've coached. And they know more than we ever will. When you coach somebody that knows more than you, you have to respect them. So on the X and O side, I just saw the game play, being played at a far higher tempo with competitive small area drills and half ice drills that I can recognize the pur purpose of, but the average coach from any team, NHL or other, might not, they might say, what the hell are they doing? Well, I knew what they were doing and trying to accomplish, and the drills accomplished their purpose in the games so the takeaways come from the art of coaching side and not the x and o side because the the players themselves do not feel respected growing up they've been coached and directed in the way they've been coached and the generation of players today and the learning of the today by them they are the leaders in how you deal with them and that's that's primarily, Daryl, the buy-in by uh, the head coach and, and by the American League coach and watching them run practice. That was the most amazing thing. You know, the, the drills they did, uh, Daryl did a practice, were uh, unique. He designs them and, and tweaks them his way, and the staff knows what he's trying to do, and the coaching staff observing and scouts know what he's trying to do. And when the scouts came up at the end of the uh, at the last game, during the last game, I'm standing with Haley and Danielle and a little bit of a perch, and the head scout of, of scouting came over and said, uh, got to compliment the work you guys have done because this is the best camp we've ever had. The most physicality, the most uh, playing under pressure and highly high degree of competition. So when the head scout sees the result of that, 
that you, you've got a result. So X's and O's, uh, you know, as far as the dr drills go, uh, they they run, uh, Haley with the big the big the big players ran, and Daryl they run conventional games and conventional drills. Every one of them we'd be familiar with. Uh, the players are decision making and competing. They want to compete. They want to have fun. They don't want to have deliberate practice in any way, shape, or form because it's unless you can really offer something above and beyond what they're capable of, um, it, it, it might be counterproductive. And I think that's the case. A lot of coaching is behind the time with today's generation of player. And I'm not just saying at the NHL. Just from what I witnessed with these American League players, uh, they're capable of far more in terms of application of new skills that I haven't even, you know, I'm not even familiar with that is, are not being taught necessarily by them, but by taught by real skill experts who just work on the skating with a puck, the agility in all direction skating, the jam turn, the stop turn, whatever you do. And Daryl is able to extrapolate that to the game and thinking in the game, because all the players are getting this skill work and they've just got to know how to execute it within the systems of play. And the systems are play. We've talked about it. You know, it's a one, two, three, four, five hockey and interchanging positions and absolutely no time. And Tim, the biggest takeaway I got was a drill the American League coach ran. His first uh, two drills, the first warm up drill was a th three on zero horseshoe, but it, it was three one on ones simultaneously with separation at full speed, finishing with a shot from each shooting lane. I'd never seen that before. I've seen one on zero, two on zero, three on zero, but it was three one on, three, three on, one on zeros with shots. Now here's the drill, Tim, that I took away from the philosophy of play, and we've had this debate about surfing and standing up in the neutral zone and not playing rushes conventionally, transition skating. Well, he, the coach, this is the American League coach. This was his drill design. It was a three on two horseshoe. Full speed, but the 2D pressured all the time. They didn't let him they pressured at the far blue line. They pressed straight up in the neutral zone. And there was not one clear breakaway. There was a lot of pressured shots. But it, it told me, uh oh, the era of conventional playing of rushes is over. So the way they played in the neutral zone is predicated by that drill told me. And I was going to... Uh, I'd love to talk to Dan Price with Victoria. He's the GM and head coach because we had long conversations about, I'm the guy who said, you got to learn to transition skate and stride backwards. But after that practice and watching the games, I'm, I'm thinking, Ooh, I guess this is the way the game's going. It's not as important as I thought it would be. So that was my biggest X and O takeaway Tim. my, um, the idea of, uh, skills coaches, when Daryl ran the ice, there's uh, three or four other skills coaches all constructively occupied. And the biggest thing they do with, with the players is talk to them. They're communicating and they're, they're engaged. And the players know that. There's that, you know, it's not that supervision or direction. It's that I'm there. What do you need? And um they don't tell them they'll they'll ask them what do you think here's an idea but these kids and i was impressed with the skill level they, there was 18 to 27 year olds there was uh, undrafted kids kids who've been drafted by them free agents um, signed prospects uh just a cross-section of players from all over the world 
uh, participating. And it was that the fact that this group of coach and player developers was running it and doing their thing in terms of getting the players to and be engaged and enjoy it. And practices were high tempo, highly competitive. And if, if they learned one thing was giving them rest breaks, possibly dropping a drill, taking some timeouts. And I observed the coaching on the ice, not the players. I observed the, um, when they interrupted a drill, it was really neat because there was a girl named Randy from UNH who was a skills coach, primary skater, and she made a, you know, stop the drill and in a real firm voice made the point that you got to be more competitive. This isn't good enough. It was a tremendous intervention. And Daryl followed up with it about 10 minutes later. The impact of those two interventions on the tempo of the practice, it was like, wow. So the art of coaching is what I got out of the week, uh, more than anything, and the importance of, of looking at things differently and doing things differently and seeing a, a result occur, the transference of that work in practice to the games by those young players and it's embraced by the superstars of the club team so well, i don't know just to interject uh, wally it would be good as a follow-up um if you have video on those two drills in particular to uh stick those videos up for uh anybody that's listening in now that wants to take a look at those two drills um, I'm not sure you said both the three on three times one on one or three times one yeah. on zero. I'm not I, sure. I, I, work, I, I don't think I have the videos of them, Tim. You, ha you have to visualize them. Well, like, say, it's, it's not it's not really for me so much as other people. Yeah. Like you could probably get some video from Daryl even uh, yeah. or Healy. Uh, but it would be just nice for people to see what really impressed you. On, yeah. on the X and O level, yeah. Saying I'm not, uh, I'm not, and this is what I learned from it, um, Tim. I know you had mentioned you might be able to show that winning goal Canada scored, and wondering how to play it defensively. The Americans gave it up, and I'm, I'm saying I can discuss it as a coach, and you can give your opinion of the drill, but. I, the, the whole point of this is, what do the players think of that drill? And I think it adds up to their performance of the, from what they've gained from the drill. So their thoughts are really important to me. You know, the, I, I, to, I totally agree. Um, but, our, but our role as coaches at the same time is to be educated ourselves and um, be prepared to help or assist or guide the players thinking, um, especially younger players, because, you know, we're, we're right now, like you've often pointed out, we're talking about elite players who are, have a, for the most part, <laughs> a very high level of hockey IQ. And a lot of the coaches listening are coaching younger kids that have not developed that IQ yet and are learning the game so it's our job as coaches to to help them in that regard yeah no i i understand what you're saying and i agree in minor hockey uh looking at the drill <clears throat> normally it would be run three on two with separation and the two d's skating backwards with transition skating establishing gaps and how do you play a three on two well they don't know how to skate and play that situation defensively. They don't know how to pass and receive on the horseshoe in terms of timing. So there's individual skills and passing and timing. I think we do very adequately. We do. But coaches don't teach those skills, let alone transfer them to apply them in the conventional way you run a drill to the level of running a drill this way where you're asking the players questions because they have the skills to do the drill. 
So you're absolutely right. Uh, you're, you, I think you have, my question is, what is the level of, identify the level of the player and intervene with the right stuff, the right amount at the right time with that level of player that you're working with. Uh, the level of players that I witnessed, which were these, you know, all elite players, was I, I couldn't add anything to any drill that I saw for, as a coach. Like I, I watch how they delivered the drills. I watch how they ran them. I saw the pre-ice with the before the players saw the pre-ice video, and I saw it performed. So, you know, I I don't know that I would even run that three on two full pressure drill with a minor hockey team, but I might do it with a college team. I might, because I know they can skate the conventional one-on-ones, you know, I'm not sure. So, so Kim's, Kim's got her hand up and I'll I'll have a a follow-up to that as well, but go ahead, Kim. Yeah, I just, I mean, this is sort of a bit more my wheelhouse because I don't, work with the elite elite all the time. I wanted to share a story of transference uh, that I have from this past weekend. So we've started, um, we call it the high performance program, but all our double A teams now get skills with me every two weeks. And uh, we do concept. I just pick a concept and I teach the concept. So this past week, myself and our midget double A coach did initiating contact when you have the puck. I know we've talked about examples of that before but not initiating contact when you don't have it but when you have it drive skating you know getting your butt in their hands that sort of thing and so I taught the identical practice from U11 AA all the way up to U18 AA identical drills nothing changed now the U18 AA team to your point Wally was able to do things at a higher intensity perhaps on a relative scale, I mean, the U11 AA's were still doing it at full intensity, just doesn't look at the same intensity, right? And they're, you know, again, it was mostly you've already got control of the puck and you're using your body to own the space. So, you know, their stick handling wasn't as smooth. They weren't able to do maybe as many turn backs, that sort of thing. Uh, but the really cool part was uh, the midget AA team did the practice at 11 a.m. and they had a game that night at six. And I went and watched the game. And I saw six examples of those players doing exactly what I taught. So they got pinned on the wall, they pushed off the wall, put their butt in the player's hands and made a move. And so uh, my, I said to the coach after, did anyone pick those out? Because that's the stuff I get excited about. They won 7-2, I don't care. <laughs> I was excited about that. And she said every single time it happened, either a player on the bench or one of the assistant coaches pointed it out. Right. So the point to me, like to your point, you know, Tim and Wally is like, I know exactly the drill you're talking about. And I would teach it as a one on two with a weak side D angles across and skates forward. Um, I would use that in minor hockey. So there's a one on one, but the weak side D comes across to forward skate and angle that um, attacking forward down. Um, but I think it's it's less drill and skill and it's the concept in between. Uh, that I think these uh, more elite players or more experienced players, you know, seem to have a little bit more innately or have the hockey IQ for. I, I think it can be taught, um, but it, you know, it's finding that sweet spot between a drill and a system that, you know, a lot of minor hockey coaches might not have the experience teaching conceptual hockey. They can teach a drill and they can teach a system and they can play small area games, but you know, can they really teach putting your butt in the hands and, and spinning off and uh, like Daryl ish type of drills? Um, you know, and, and that's where you see the transference in minor hockey to the games. And, and it was really cool to hear that the players themselves. So these would be 14 to 17 year old girls, you know, elite in the fact they're double A. But, you know, I'm not sure any of them are ever going to end up on the Olympic team. Um, and they saw it. Every single one of them saw it. And they knew what what they were seeing. So, you know, I, I don't think we need to, I think we've got to meet them where they are. And certainly, you know, that three on two full pressure, I wouldn't even run with a junior team. <laughs> it would be a, you know, a yard sale. But um, I, I think we can take what you learned at the Leafs session 
and not dumb it down, just bring it to where these players are um, and present it in such a way that, you know, they could actually execute it in a game and not only just execute it, but actually identify it in a game, which I think is the key. Because if you do it, but you can't identify that you did it, like, you know, that, that to me is a certain level of control or understanding you have to have, that you did it and you know that you did it and you know why you did it. Um, you know, that's what we're trying to get to, I think. Listen, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm going to have to run and I'll check with my wife. If I don't get back, you guys continue on. Uh, hopefully I can get back. And uh, Kim, you know, just listening to your, your reply, you'd be in the tier with Danielle and, and Haley working with those guys because you do this for a living and doing it specifically to the detail that you do, I think you get it. And uh, having had Daryl on and with our group in a long period of time and watching him run practices with his daughter and then all of us just about watching her her play at the under-18 camp, I now understand uh, the value of this. So I'm going to leave you all. Uh, just continue your conversation. And Tim, if, if you wanted to you know, show that clip, you do what you want. I'll, I'll Hopefully I can get back. Take care, everyone. Okay, good, Wally. So give our best to Carol there. Um, and uh, I, I was just hoping to follow up with Wally, and maybe I will next week. Um, as we were discussing this, it it, uh, it occurred to me, or I wondered if Wally had had any discussion with Daryl and or Haley, uh, who, whoever was, or I guess it was their American League coach who was running that 3v2 horseshoe drill. Was there a purpose or a focus in the drill for them? Because it occurred to me that they could have been, they could have told the D to pressure all you can all over the place because their focus was on trying to, uh, like the focus was on the offensive side, helping the players uh, learn to, you know, pick their way through that kind of pressure and situation um, versus it being uh, a drill for the D to teach them to check this way. Or so it would be interesting to know what Daryl and Haley felt uh, like, why did they do that drill and what do they want to get out of it? Maybe a little bit of both, but it sounds like perhaps it wasn't a teaching drill so much defensively, but it could have been uh, just sort of a random uh, read and solve the problem type drill for the offensive players. So it'd be, I'll kind of follow up with them if we can uh, next week on that. Anybody else had any random thoughts on that? It's hard when you don't see the, when we can't see the drill exactly, but. Tim, um, with you on the call, I would love to get your take on Women's Worlds. Um, mm. If you're willing to move into that direction now, I've been waiting patiently for, um, your whole take on the entire championship with your team, but then also on the final and everything. But if uh, more people want to talk about, it's hard to talk about what Wally went through without Wally here. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I mean, I'm, I'm happy to sort of migrate to, uh, to other, um, to other topics. And that's a fine one. We, we did talk about it a little bit a, a couple of weeks ago, um, I think, or did we, uh, it seems to me I was on, after anyway, uh, in a nutshell, um, I would I sort of would echo Poundy and Rod Black's um, uh, comments about it, it all was was organized and carried off extremely well. Um, there was only the one I think one uh, COVID positive test. It was a, an arena staff person through the whole the whole event, which was tremendous. Uh, so they, uh, you know, kudos to them for carrying it off and at least, um, you know, you know in, a, in a safe manner, um, n no mean feat. Uh, in, in terms of the hockey, I thought, um, again, really, really awesome. Um, you know, where, where do you start? 
um, you know, I, I felt really badly for for Thomas and the Czech team. Um, they really deserved to beat Finland and get to a semifinal or quarterfinal or semifinal, I guess. And, um, you know, and then turning around and having some sort of tough puck luck against Japan just ended on a real down note for them. But they're they're the next team in my mind. Uh, Japan, very good team, and they've got some really, really good young players, too, that they're going to add to their mix in the next couple of years. So, like, Japan and the Czechs are really are really coming, and they're, I really feel that they're going to be a challenge um, uh, sort of for the third spot. Obviously, Canada and the U.S. are still um, have a, a leg or two up on everybody else, but um, the depth of the, of the pool is really improving uh, rapidly, um, which is really, really exciting for the women's game. Um, some people will say it's been a long, long time coming. I, I, I don't really take that view myself. We've, we, we globally have only really been at it for a little over 20 plus years in a very serious way in, in women's hockey, if you start counting from 98. But so those are some global comments. I mean, in, in terms of Canada, U.S., I've, I've never seen um, – it's the best Canada has looked in a long, long time. I think I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, the, particularly the round-robin first two periods against the U.S., it, it was, um, you know, if not dominant, bordering on dominant the first two periods. Uh, and I haven't seen us look that good against the U.S. for a long time. So that's encouraging for us on this side of the border. Um, the U.S. are a tremendously skilled team and a deep team. And, you know, they're going to have something to say about how they respond come February. But uh, on balance, um, I don't know, I'll, I'll stop talking, but great, really great event. Um, great to uh, take part in it. Uh, we were a little disappointed in our performance with the Danish team. We were a little unbalanced. Uh, not quite as good, I don't think, as we could be, but um, we're ready to reload for our Olympic qualifier in November. So I don't know if anybody has any specific questions but um, or other comments, I guess. So, Tim, I have a quick question. Uh, obviously, you watched the gold medal game. Like, uh, did, did, did anyone in particular stand out to you on – on either team, I guess, being way better than advertised or perhaps we shouldn't go towards the less bad, less less than advertised. But was there anyone, like, I'm curious on Canada, that you know perhaps you had some expectations of going in who completely blew you out of the water in terms of what they were able to do in that game, right? On the biggest stage in that moment, you know, who, who surprised you for Canada? Well, I, again, I think uh, it's a good question. I, I think I mentioned a couple of weeks ago as well, like the thing that struck me the most really about Canada was uh, I really feel the girls, uh, the women have all worked extremely hard over the last couple of years to improve themselves physically. Um, you know, and to mention a few players like uh, Jamie Lee, uh, for, for sure, I think has added a, a step of quickness to her game. Um, uh, Victoria Bach, the same thing. I didn't, I didn't recognize Victoria Bach. Um, from, like I've, I've seen her, but I haven't seen her for three or four years. Really worked hard at improving the skating level of their game, which I think really, really helped Canada. And as a group, it's the best we've stacked up against them for a long time in the skating department. In the gold medal game in particular, uh, I, I'm not sure there's anybody that really would have stood out for me, uh, you know, in the way you phrase the question in terms of really um, performing at a high level in that game um, unexpectedly. Um, I'm not sure I, I would put my finger on anybody um, other than the obvious that, you know, Pooh just did it and seems to always do it. Um, so it was, uh, but it was, it was tremendous hockey to watch. 
sitting with the Danish girls. It was kind of funny uh, the, when we were watching the U.S.-Canada round robin game. Obviously, I think the first time a lot of them or any of them would have seen a live Canada-U.S. game. And a couple of them just turned around and said to me, oh, this is a whole different level. This is as good or as fast as the men's league in Denmark. So they were they were very impressed, um, but it's again as we all know it's great hockey to watch. But I thought uh, uh, just entertaining as well. But nobody really stood out for me in that uh, gold medal game. I was really happy for uh, Anne Renee, especially with the you know uh, I mean uh, I, I will say a tough start for her in that game. Uh, the, the getting down to nothing. Uh, she did have a little bit of history of not performing as well as she maybe liked it on, on the stage when she got the stage. So I was really happy for her that she just shut the door after that, played very well. Awesome. Um, so that, that was really, actually, she might be that person for me that uh, I, I wondered about going in. Even with her great pedigree, she has struggled on the very big stage at times to her career. So great for her to really come through. Yeah, I was gonna, like, I clipped about, I just counted 75 different clips from the Worlds. I didn't get as many as I would have liked from, um, I guess, the, the non-Canada US games. Uh, I think it's, when you know a bunch of the players, you tend to watch their games a bit more, but, um, I mean, as a as a hockey person, I think Melody Dow is the next wave of what women's hockey should be, uh, because her clips I have of her poise and her ability to turn it back and slow it down. And this is coming from the perspective of someone who coaches largely girls hockey, at minor hockey. It's always go go go, speed it up, get north fast, go go go, kind of old school hockey. And I was so happy to see and be able to clip out all these clips of Melody turning it back, you know, or under like there's one clip. I can't I think it was from it might have been from Germany where she's she's typically slowing it down, turning it back in the neutral zone. And against Germany, her whole team's changing. She takes everybody on one on three and gets a shot on net. Right. Like her ability to manipulate the game. Um, you know, and, and I think, you know, Deckard's typically able to do that. I, I, I wasn't overly impressed with the U.S.'s. But certainly their top two lines weren't very impressive in, in the tournament. Um, but I think Melody Dau was, and I know she's always sort of under the radar a little bit. She shouldn't be. But to me, if I'm teaching players the concepts of poise and where to utilize skills properly, I, I think she's she's the best I saw in that tournament. Um, and so arguably the best in the world um, at that. But uh, I just think that's an area that women's hockey in general could be a lot better at. Um, Kim, it really reminded me of like a Jen Botterill or Summer West or even mm -hmm. Sherry Piper, that it just looks like everybody else should just be taking the puck off them and they just are nowhere near anybody else. Like they just have this innate sense of the ice and where the open ice is. And they often look slower or lazier when Dao would sort of turn back in the zone. I think, where are, you, where are you going with the puck? Like, everybody else is going the other way. You know, what are you doing? And then all of a sudden, it's this amazing scoring opportunity. But to see that in real time, it's one thing to see it from, you know, up top. But for her to see it in real time at that level was, I thought, spectacular. And I and I would, I would add, I, I totally agree that Melo was... Uh... Uh, really as good as anybody uh, in the tournament. But she has always been, always been an elite offensive player. But, uh, and she is a real good example of, of what I mentioned before. Her skating has gone to a different level over the last three or four years. She's added a bit of speed, added a bit of quickness, and, and totally impressed with her commitment and dedication fighting through, uh, you know, numerous very serious injuries and to be able to do that um, to add that level of skating at this point is is really impressive but she's always been uh, one of the elite offensive thinkers much like Sammy's saying like Jen Jen was the same uh, pipes was the same 
Um, so that 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 part didn't surprise me, and she is probably with Pooh, uh, probably they're two of the best two the two best uh, offensive hockey thinkers, um, certainly on our side of the border, and they've got some on the other side as well. Um, but uh, yeah, she was very very impressive. So, so what's I was the back impressed. Story on oh, go ahead, Bob. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Bob. Backstory on on rat rate. Um, not because I've not watched a lot of women's hockey, but when I saw her on the ice, I thought she was a dominant player, and yet she didn't seem to get a lot of ice time, especially early in the tournament. Is there is there something? Is there a history there? Or what's the story there? She's like the thirteen forward, right? Yeah. yeah. So. I, yeah, mean, I think that's the way I, she started. Go ahead, Sammy. I can give it to you from my perspective, Bob, only because we're close to her, but um, is that she's simply kind of newer into the program at that level. So I think that they don't have the trust in her yet, um, which shouldn't, she's in her late 20s. So how old is she, Kim? Probably about 27, 28, something like that. I would guess. She's this, Yeah, she's the same age as like like nurse, like that. Yeah, that so she group. came yeah. out, she won the Patty Kaz, uh, um collegiately uh won the NCAA for Clarkson was the you know part of that first wave at Clarkson was sort of a dominant player came into the CWHL um was a dominant player within the CWHL won the scoring title right away but similar to you know Kim and I talked about this player Summer West um she always had this what I think the national team perceived her as a slow skater um you know she was a bigger girl kind of more of a uh power forward but she had these incredible hands and i think she never really showed her speed um she was not centralized for the last olympic games and uh you know maybe not in as good a shape as she could have been whatever here they're near they neither here or there but um decided to really emphasize off ice training at that point and so throughout the whole uh, olympic last four years really has dedicated herself to being um, the best testing athlete, but that has really also translated on the ice to her speed and her skating. So she uh, stopped working with the national team uh, trainers here in uh, Toronto and started working with uh, football coaches for speed and for uh, maneuverability. So she's been working with CFL football coaches and CFL guys mostly training, you know, in tandem with the national team, but really took that year of not being centralized to change the complete focus and listen to what the coaches were telling her too, that she um, didn't have the speed, didn't have this, um, you know, adaptability at that that higher level. So, um, but it's been a slow progress back into the foray. So then she uh, got cut from the next world's team, um, but made the the following year, but didn't get much playing time. Um, but still throughout that sort of led her Markham team and dominated with that team. Um, but Victoria Bach was on her team. Other players seemed to kind of get more notoriety than she did. Uh, Laura Stacy was on her team. Um, and I, I don't know. I mean, she just, to me, just this wonderful personality of a person who's very humble and perhaps is not um, asserting herself enough at that level i i don't know because there's no knock against her attitude wise she certainly is a consummate teammate um she's somebody that can play the 13th forward very very well and that sometimes is hard because then the coaches put her in that position you know all the time um so that's kind of my take on it kim but what's your would you say that that's kind of what you feel yeah i i coached jamie back with team ontario like i think it was 2007 like it's a long time ago I, yeah, I mean, always been offensively talented, you know, like a Piper, like a Summer, um, you know, maybe didn't traditionally fit the mold. I I would say, you know, she's the dominant power forward F1 with skill and scoring ability, which, you know, I don't know that Team Canada has an overabundance of those who truly can uh, drive skate to the net, dominate the wall down low. And, you know, either finish or give it to someone else. You know, they've got a nurse who they put in the middle. I'm not sure about that decision. Um, you know, they've got Spooner, who I think has improved tremendously. She was also, I think, on that team with Jamie Lee back in 2007. But, you know, to me, Jamie Lee fits like a very, like a role that they need. 
right? Like they actually need that bigger body F1 who, you know, uh, the American Ds didn't look great in that gold medal game, but they got some big D down there that are going to push you around. Um, and so, like, I think there's a need there from the Team Canada roster based on what I've seen. And I think Jamie Lee fits it to a T um, because I do think when it comes down to it in the Olympics, that physicality and that ability to, you know, grind it out with skill is is going to be the difference. Um, and I thought well, she looked great. Your question as to why she, after she played so well in that first U.S. game, did not get on one of the top two lines. I think everybody in women's hockey was kind of... Um, unsure of that decision but you know maybe that was the coach's plan and that's just they wanted to revert back to the plan when the injured players came back I I'm not sure maybe T Tim or Wally might have more insight on why she just wasn't automatically inserted uh, into the lineup well, she well, certainly had a big impact on the games yeah mm -hmm. that's a I mean that's a different discussion I have happy to have it just wanted to interject like really if if I could go back to save us time, I go back and everything I just said about Melo applies to Jamie Lee. Uh, she's always been a tremendous offensive player, gifted offensive player. And, you know, Sammy used the words, was perceived by Hockey Canada as too slow. She was too slow before. She, not, not her top end speed, because she could get going, but she was missing that sort of first step, get up, go quickness. And she had trouble being effective at the international level, her first several goes with the national team. And so again, I really credit Jamie Lee, who we all know, like just a tremendous person, somebody every coach would love to have on their team, happy, uh, really great teammate, tremendous credit for her to do what Sammy outlined to dig down and add that step of quickness and a little bit extra speed in her game and uh, you know she had a coming out party um, I mean after that I'd be I'd be shocked if she's not on the Olympic roster a lot can happen between now and then but I they I, Wally and I were talking about it yesterday a bit and we can sort of merge into that a little bit but you know, they don't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, they've got a pretty damn good group there, a group that feels good about themselves. The biggest questions for me would be, you know, Mick, Megan Mickelson, and uh, and Tino, Fort Laura Fortino. Obviously, two very good players. Um, how and where might they fit in? Uh, I love their uh, Fortino's not even centralized. Um I didn't, I didn't, okay, well, I didn't know that. I haven't studied the, uh, so anyway, so Mick then is the big question, is how and where does she fit in? Uh, she certainly can, and I love their decor, the way they played um, at Worlds, but I, I don't know that they have to um, find a new recipe for, for uh, Beijing. I mean, they've got a pretty good recipe now. So just my, my two cents there, like Jamie Lee, Definitely one of those forwards who uh, definitely deserves <laughs> credit for sticking with it and improving her game uh, on a physical level, uh, skating-wise. Guys, I'd like to get back on if I could. And before Tim... Oh, you can't, Wally. We don't want you. No yeah. way. Well, I'm... Uh, and, you know, I just came in when Kim was expressing herself. Sammy was talking about some speed adaptability. I'd like to caution every one of us. We've coached. We've been in the program. We got all our opinion. We got nothing to do with it. And, and what, what I've discovered is you can have your opinion, but the people who are there and making those decisions and responsible for them, they did a pretty good job getting to the point where they are. Whether you use Rattray or not, you can debate it. And who you play with, that's their job. They got a result, they're on track. And I wanted to share this with you before we sort of dissected what they should do and shouldn't do. Um, yeah, we've got opinions and they're nice to listen to. But uh, I, I believe what, what's happened, and this is a story and the reason I'm interjecting, uh, Daryl's daughter was participating in the under 18 camp. 
he had to fly home and got rerouted, so he had to stay overnight and go the next day. And perchance sat in an aisle seat opposite Troy Ryan, the head coach in the other aisle seat. And it was hilarious how they four hour flight, how they talk nonstop hockey. And Daryl, I'm sure, did most of the talking and Ryan did most of the note taking. Troy did most of the note taking. That to me was a turning point. That was the U18 camp. I believe that Daryl talked about everything we've talked about with him and everything I saw at the Leafs camp. The 50, the team being 50, it was 10 years behind. And he said, to, uh, Troy, it's 15 years behind. And they talked about it and he got to share his ideas. I believe Daryl's made a, an impression. I hope they continue a relationship and Daryl gets reinvolved in the program from which we've all been uh, removed from. And I think it's just getting it on track. My big concern is the ethical track, not the X and O track. Daryl, his X and O track is, is what I believe Troy is, is buying into and adapting and how you manage your bench. That's up to him. Centralization is a different kettle of fish. But I am totally optimistic. Uh, Tim, I saw the result. I liked the way they played. We were as good as the U.S., if not better three on three. We have a darn good chance moving forward. Having talked to Daryl, knowing about that conversation that I did not know about, I think it's going to be fine. And we're, we're no longer in a position, uh, I think, to... To, to really, uh, we can be asked for ideas and that, but I don't know what to say anymore because I don't have enough ideas. Everything you've thought and said, yeah, it's valid, it's applicable. But I think the people that are still in the game at that level, um, they'll get it figured out. Now it'll be sooner than later. And I'm really happy with the way things are going. So that's my two bits worth. Go ahead, Kim. Well, you're going to get my two bits worth, Wally. Um, you know what? Lots of people make lots of money at, with things like Leafs lunch and all the things that debate about the NHL. And I think if we can have that similar type of conversation with slightly more educated people, I think we're doing a service to female hockey. I think that world championship was a service to women's hockey. The fact they showed all the games the fact you had that phenomenal commentating and play-by-play -play with a lot of great females, not, not just on the Canadian broadcast, but on the, the, you know, the French, or sorry, the English broadcast, the French broadcast. And, you know, I think we still do have a hand in it. I think I do. I, I don't know if everyone else feels the same way about their particular roles. Um, you know, but to go back to the debate, you know, you go, you look at Jamie Lee and you go, well, who was she taking the spot of when she jumped in was Victoria Bach, who's arguably one of the best scorers in women's hockey as well, and maybe didn't show it as much in the worlds. But if you watched all their shifts, which I did, she came about this close to scoring every single time she touched the puck. So had the pucks gone in for Victoria, maybe Jamie's not getting into that line, right? So I think, you know, to your point, Wally, they know that. That's why she was still in there. She was by by no means wasn't being useful. And she is also an elite offensive talent. Right. But I think we're doing a service to the game by having debates like this, because where else are you going to find it? Where else is this conversation happening? I, I see a lot more reporters covering it. You know, I think Cheryl and and all the people on the broadcasts are going to, you know, debate. But I think this might be a forum for this type of conversation that right now doesn't exist. Yeah. So, you know, I'm happy to talk it all day. And I think by saying, well, they'll figure it out. You know, if, if the U.S. had won that game, you know, we would we would be debating even more so. So, you know, it's not perfect. But can I, uh, can I interrupt? Sure. <laughs> Go for sure? it, Wally. I, I'm, I'm really glad that you said that because, you know, I've always wanted to 
speak my mind. And I, like Thomas and like Tim, we want to talk to the powers to be because we coached in the program. We grew up in it. And to be totally left out hurts. So our expertise is of value. Uh, everybody that's in charge now, they're going to receive this 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 a video of this call so they're going to get the message whether they want it or not it's valuable just like the leafs to be honest and open and have conversations those haven't occurred in the past that's why coaches who have played on the national team and are coaching are not even involved in the program because they couldn't share what they knew about what was going on. And that's, it, it can't happen. You have to be like the Leafs organization, open to learning, open to disagreement, open to fierce conversations. At the end of the day, the head coach makes the decision. And I think because they won, and I always say when they won, the head coach is right. He was ratry, perfect. How many players could play so little and step up at such timely fashion? She may be the best 13th forward in the world. And using her at the right time, that was, it worked out like an art. Whether it was planned, you don't know. But um, they have to figure it out. They're there. And now, at least, people are talking to them and they're listening. and. It'll be a better program when that occurs. You you can't have um, people rise in an organization that uh, participate and lead in it without having uh, an appreciation of what, what went on before, what was learned before. And I think Daryl's the one guy who's at least had a conversation with the most important guy, the head coach. And that's huge. I actually phoned Daryl this uh, pardon me, Troy, this morning and left a message. I don't know that it'll get back to me. But I talked to Troy about, I'm really glad you had the conversation on the plane. I'd love to talk to you about it. I don't want to say anything about X's and O's anymore. Daryl's the guy that can express his philosophical views with him, and that's really important. The thing I like about what Daryl does in the Chicago Steel is, I'm a roll the lines guy, and he rolls the line with the Chicago Steel. And managing the bench is going to be the biggest issue with the Maple Leafs and the star players and the contracts. But boy, in the American League teams and the ECHL team, uh, they'll be able to roll the lines to a greater extent so everybody feels a part of it. That's my biggest fear, centralization, female hockey. Players being pigeonholed into roles too soon and losing belief in themselves to be the best they can be. I think they've got some belief now, and I think it's going to go from there. And I, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident about it anyway. Go ahead, Kim. Anything else? Yeah, just, you know, I think the impact is like, I'm not sure anyone up there is going to listen to me anytime soon. And, and that's, that's not the intent, actually, for me. It, it's the impact from from us down that I think is what's important, right? Whether that's college players, minor hockey players, minor hockey coaches, how do you take, you know, and the, the Jamie Lee thing is a perfect example. Every girl that complains about ice time or impact or I couldn't do this because I didn't get a chance, like there's your example for the rest of time in women's hockey. You cannot get a better storyline than that for someone and again should we roll the lines yes 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 of course but you know if for whatever reason you're not getting that opportunity and it's a pity party there's exhibit a and that's what i you know i'll write an article about it when i get around to it but that's what i think minor hockey needs it needs those women doing as amazing as they did and those coaches doing the great job that they did and then how do we weave that into our narrative on the day-to-day when you have a kid who got up at six, went to field hockey practice, went to whatever all day, you know, had soccer after school, came to your hockey practice, and you're still trying to inspire her, you know, to be potentially at that level one day, 
right? So I, I think all these, you know, I think our debates are useful because of where we've all been. But I'm quite frankly more concerned or more interested in how do we bring this to the masses so that they can understand what Amelia Dow did or exactly what makes Poulin so great or et cetera, et cetera. Um, because that's where you really have maximum impact. You know, the, the results from the national team are always going to have a massive impact, right? But something that's tangible, that's usable, um, I think has to go from our level down uh, with the wealth of experience and expertise that we have. So, um, you know, I certainly would, I know better than to tell anyone, um, you know, at on any national team level what to do. Uh, I'm more interested on in how I bring it back down the mountain um, to inspire and educate, you know, the next generation of players who'll be there in, you know, eight to 12 years. Yeah. Uh, Tim, <clears throat> You know, you had mentioned the the, the uh, winning goal we scored and breaking it, it down technically, and I I wanted to. You sent a text following that that said you were evaluating um, the the local associations. What team was it? Your voice, Tim. Tim was evaluating some minor it was, hockey. Uh, it was, it was uh, U13 C and D level players just walked across the street. Yep. So to Kim's point, I'd rather talk about that than the uh, than our goal because that's where a difference is going to be made. How you select the team and proper selection process, and uh, you know I've. Witness somebody who developed a system that won eight age division city championships in their community in the city of Calgary. And they made two number one teams, played in the city final against the desire of the executive board. And they picked the team the right way. They evaluated for development and they placed kids where they should be. And they won. Eight out of eleven, apparently, city championships, and they didn't get their job back. These are former players that I've coached, so that's the dilemma that makes a big difference. I mean, who wins the Grey Cup is one thing, but the guffuffle going on in the minor hockey game—I'm really dedicating my life to improving that. That's that's where I come from. So, Greg, I'm curious, you've. You've seen, you've heard and seen and done many podcasts, and you've had a pretty eclectic group uh, t today. I, I'm curious about what you're taking out of this nutty group today. Well, uh, I feel like I'm the only one who doesn't have a connection uh, too much to the women's national program there up in Canada, so I don't have too much to add to the specific players uh, and whatnot. I, I did watch some of the championships. And uh, I believe Tim mentioned it, being impressed by the Czech team. Uh, specifically, I really liked how they were they're doing a lot of these tactics we were talking about earlier, like surfing. Um, they did a ton of angling in the neutral zone. And uh, even on the offensive side, uh, they were very good about uh, changing lanes through the rush, things like that. So I uh, don't have too much to add on the Canadian national team there. But I'm, I guess I'm kind of more curious about overarching, you know, how – how do people, and again, we want to take this mainstream, but how do we connect with people uh, to get these things down? Obviously, I've got the newsletter and podcast, and that's kind of my way of trying to get out to the masses more. But other potential ways or, you know, do we, I mean, like, for example, in Ohio here, we have, I think it's called it's like the Positive Coaching Alliance. And they go between sports, and it's all about going into the coaches and doing exactly what we're talking about, of creating a positive environment and doing things the right way and equitable rolling lines, things like that. I, I've used the Positive Coaching Alliance, and we've referred to it often, but over many years, <clears throat> Phil Jackson and his role, and uh, we've all talked about Phil Jackson's book, 11 Rings, and it's been a big part of this group's uh, philosophy uh, in coming to be in serving the good of the game. And I think 
uh, you know, being able to get what we're talking about and having had people in our group work at such a high level and Tom has worked at this high a level in other countries in the world. And uh, it's just, uh, there's so much knowledge here to share. And for the first time in my life, I felt comfortable sharing it with a, an NHL organization. And I got to see every level of how they do things. And I think it's going to be pretty fruitful moving forward. Uh, am I worried? <laughs> Will they win the cup and keep their jobs? Will they not win the cup and lose their jobs? But that's the reality of the business of sport. But they're doing things the right way. And whether it's business or sport, I think the best organizations, Tampa Bay being one of them, is definitely inclusive and open. And uh, when you bring all employees on the ice for the team picture after winning the Stanley Cup. I hope to see the Leafs do that someday soon. Yes, maybe we uh, dive back into some of your experiences uh, up with the Leafs and more things. Uh, I know, Tim, you had some questions. I was was just going to comment they could they could all start in toronto by winning a playoff series let alone the stanley cup to help them keep their jobs somewhat facetiously and i'm sure they will down the road they're too too good a group not to but i, I was also going to just uh, thanks for that greg i'm just going to interject go back to wally's comment about um uh, centralization and you know I, I certainly don't really share the concern about players getting pigeonholed um even my experience in centralization 15 years ago was completely the opposite, where every player was given every role and outli- that role was outlined to them um, on a game-to-game basis. Today, you're not playing power play. You're going to kill penalties. Today, you're going to play some power play but not kill penalties. Today, you're going to be the, you know, the, the more of the checking line role. Uh, Today, you're the extra forward. Like, everybody was given every role so that we could learn as much as we possibly could about each player's capability in all those situations and each player's reaction um, and ability to play at their best in, in, you know, when given different roles. So I'm not sure I share the concern that people are going to get pigeonholed. I, I think it's a great... A uh, blank slate, open canvas for for Troy and the staff to just do lots of experimenting and um, and see uh, what what comes out. So, and uh, I'd be I su- I'd be surprised if they if they don't um, you know if they don't take that approach. But um, it, well, it yeah. is an opportunity. As usual, we disagree <laughs> because when you run a development camp. And both a development camp and you've created your power plays and some people get four minutes of ice in a game where the under 22 teams play the senior team. I'm worried about centralization. Because that's not the way to do things at a development camp. You've got to identify those prospects who have the skill level and let them experience power play and penalty kill and that's what i'm saying i'm worried about centralization because all the good things they've accomplished in terms of feeling well about what they've done if they don't do what you did in 2006 i'm not so i won't be as optimistic if they do what we've always done you did it in 2006 and it was a best performance ever that's what we're we're able to get the message out this way not face to face with the people and that that are concerned and in the end they're going to decide they're going to coach the way they coach and i think the biggest influence of all has already been made by daryl and i'm i just have a gut that that ride on the Uh, airplane and sitting across the aisle and the conversations um, affected the way that team played. It it showed they played differently. 
They played better than they played before. And Daryl was talking everything that he talked to with Thomas and was demonstrated in the Czech team. So the idea, these thoughts, the forward thinking has been given. And uh, after that, let nature take its course. I think this, that that was a key step to me. So, Bob, any observations? We've been national winning it and talking Toronto and... Well, I see you got your swag, so, huh. you know, so that, you've, been, you've been modeling it well the last couple of times that I've seen you, so that's good. Um, I don't know the women's program well enough. When I asked the question about uh, Ratway, my, my interest was what was her history and why was she slotted as a 13th forward when, when I saw her play, she looked much better than a 13th forward. I do think because she played that role so well, she probably was more of a glue to that team than what most people would realize. I don't know. I have no idea what she's like as a person at all. But for her to be able to come off the bench and play the way she played in the limited ice time that she had, to me, was absolutely astounding. I, I was surprised. So that speaks volumes about her as a person. So I don't know where she is going forward with the team, but from that performance, I would think she would have a more prominent role um, at the next event that they play in. But then I don't know who was, like, like I know Megan Nicholson didn't play. She's a defenseman, so I don't know. That's a spot that that would probably up for grabs. And who other the forwards were, I don't know. Uh, the young girl, uh, Philly, was that her name? Yeah. She was, she was unbelievable. She looks like, to me, like she could be the future of that team. But again, I don't, I don't know what they've got in the system. I don't know what's at the under-22 level. I have no idea. I'm, I'm sure they have a, a depth chart that they're going on, and um, I would think that they're always going to be looking for the next young one to put in that lineup to, you know, to to keep the program going. So where that leaves some of the existing girls, I mean, I, I wouldn't have a clue. And what um, I, I I just had the thought as well that. Um, it's just really interesting when you said the young, uh, looking for the next young ones. Um, you know, the U.S. had a very, really a pretty young uh, group as well. Um, equally, the teams were pretty well balanced that way. They had a lot of youngish players in their group, and they're gonna they're gonna keep getting better. The the one thing that really struck me, um, and I knew this even going in, was uh, the Lamaru factor. Uh, the Lamaroos gave that team um, a totally different feel and look. Their grit, their toughness, their uh, determination, and for sure their skill. Uh, taking them out of that lineup um, is a shift. And I'm not saying it was a totally bad decision. I mean, at some point you've got to move on and get younger players. But uh, that team has a totally different feel to it now than it did um previously uh because of those two players being such a presence physically both with their physicality and with their skill um but and, and you know and not to i guess i mean i'm happy to continue talking about the the women's game when wally when when you left uh before and and uh, how did it work out with carol anyway is is everything okay well, she's got fluid in the lungs and uh, some heart issues that appear to be manageable. And uh, there's just sort of a keeping our antenna up in terms of uh, what to do if certain things occur moving forward. So uh, at least we've got a, a knowledge of the situation and a plan of action moving forward. So yeah, well, give her, that. give her our best for sure. When that's the letters. Fingers crossed for when, when you when you left. Uh, I, I just uh, we, we were chatting and uh, we left it at the uh, you know your impressions of the leaf camp and our discussion about the, that horseshoe drill. I was curious if you had any uh, discussions with um, I guess it was, it was the AHL coach that ran the drill. No, or was it Daryl or Haley? I'm not sure. I did with all three of them. 
Yeah. Separate, so what's that? My, my, my question was, uh, like, what was their purpose for doing the drill? Like, what, what did they hope to, why did they do it as coaches? Obviously, you, you have a reason for choosing the drills you do to do. Was, was there a focus for them um, in that drill? Do, do you recall? Like, I was just curious. Well, I, I, I feel I don't have to ask because it accomplished its purpose. But well, well, was it uh, I, I, I didn't. I didn't ask that. But I did. Uh, Tim, when I sat down, like, I don't know what their level of thinking is. Here you are sitting with guys coaching in the NHL, coaching in the American League. You're invited. Daryl's running the practices. They're running the game day pregame skate. So all I am is dropped in there. No idea what the pregame skate going to be. But I'm saying it was complex in the video session. It was, I, I needed slow mo to watch it. When they went in the dressing room and and I sat between a couple players near the TV screen. He went through it like a bullet. So it wasn't until I actually saw the drill, and it wasn't until they played the game and everything they did at practice in that pregame skate showed up in the game. But the detail of teaching the three-on-two Kim gave more detail about the inside player surfing than he did. He never mentioned that. He never told them that. And that's what I mean. They figured it out. They both surfed. They never deliberately surfed the inside player. And I thought that's the kind of details Kim's doing that they weren't doing. The kids were figuring it out without those details. So just doing the drill without the details Kim gave at that level, it showed up in the game. Would it be good to have a discussion to talk about the inside player creating the pressure, steering it to the wall? I think that makes sense. That's what I call 20 years first century coaching in terms of, you know, how you're going to communicate at the level you're coaching at. Kim's doing that in double A AA and triple A programs. Not many people are doing that anywhere, let alone a three-on-two uh, pressure. I, like that. I, was, I was wondering not so much what their specific instructions or teaching points might have been. Yeah. I was just wondering globally, why did they do that drill? And what were they hoping to get out of it? Uh, not so much telling the players, do this, do that, or don't do this, don't do that. Why did they choose that drill? And what was, how did it fit into what they're trying to achieve overall? Yeah, that, that I, was, yeah. yeah that, I never had that. I, I think that's a very easy, valid question yeah. for like that I would ask at, at, at that point. It's like, well, why, why are you doing this or what do you want to get out of it? Like, I think the, the head coach having, I talked to him about it, Tim, the practice. And I, I was talking more globally. I said, when I sat in your office with the staff and Danielle and we looked at it, I said, too much, wrong, wrong amount, right stuff, wrong amount. I didn't know if it was or wasn't, but in my mind, I'm saying, oh, absolute overload. You're talking about the pregame meeting or the drill I'm specifically? I'm talking about it. I'm, I'm trying to connect all three things. Here I am judging. He's going to do a drill. He explained it. He explained to the players. And then I'm thinking right stuff, wrong amount, wrong time, uh, right way. But I wasn't sure because I didn't know whether they would get it. Well, they got it and they did it right. So the conversation I might have with them, and I don't know I would dare have it or want to interfere and interrupt with how busy he is, is, you know, how did your practice connect to what Daryl did? I think that's a good general question. And if we want to get specific, if he can get specific to a drill, because he saw Daryl's practice plans and he watched the practice, they've been coaching surfing in the NA, in, 
those teams, that's all they've done. So how much detail did he give? Did he want to give? Did he not give? Everything he did was, it worked. Now, for the average coach, Kim brought up the point of a teaching point that I wouldn't have thought of until she brought it up, and I didn't. So that's that's sort of my point. I like it's it's really tough. You're there, you're you know, and you have to sort of see how much time you can get. And I just happened to be passing by. We ran into each other in the hallway, and he was the head coach, Greg Moore. And I had such an appreciation of how little I know about the game in terms of what they're doing. Like right now, I I just, I think they know what they're doing. They're learning as they do it. And they're learning from one another and they're learning from the players. That's the part Daryl brings. So I don't know what else to say on that, Tim. I, I think, I think we could do the, you know, you could run through that drill at a coaching clinic and talk to them about different ideas of the drill and they might come up with the surfing idea. They might not know about surfing. I don't know how popular surfing is. Craig? That, Very that, popular on the coast. What's your thought on surfing and do you know what it is and where it applies and is there a debate? For an old school guy like me, I never heard of it. Well, yeah, well, actually, well, I mean, I, this particular drill, this particular drill that you that you're talking about, other than a few juniors that were at that camp, the rest of them are AHL players. I would assume are East Coast League players, players that are in their system. Is this something that they've seen for the first time? This drill, or is it something that they've maybe I, seen uh, previous and they've I been would, coached on it? I would think they've. I th I would think they've seen it previously. They've done it before. I don't know if it's the first time he ever did the drill. I, I can't say. You know, my question is, where is the game at relative to the global community to be able to do that drill? I would never have done it because I've never thought of it. Now I, I see the method of the way the game's going. So, Greg, can you mention? Yeah, I, I could jump in on this one. Um... So you're you're going to be seeing it more and more often, uh, and and many there's been a bunch of articles out about this. I forget who exactly it was. I mean, maybe it was like Brendan Dillon or something like that. Uh, but basically, I think it was someone in the San Jose system, and the entire coaching staff was was talking about how they want to see their defensemen uh, defend more, skating forward. So that's kind of the big. So surfing is is a Daryl term, uh, but what you're seeing here is a lot more defense skating forward, angling early, uh, trying to nip the play in the bud before it really gets going. Um, and, and more progressive coaches you'll see do that. I'm actually in a uh, short dialogue where we're kind of playing phone tag with a video assistant with the, the Blue Jackets because uh, I'm all about surfing uh, or we're just basically angling early. Uh, and he it was actually a specific play, um, and I could probably bring that up. And he was thinking, oh, no, you want to face that play. And I'm like, no, you want to actually skate into that play and force that to the boards rather than letting the defenseman have to take the pressure um, and have to react rather than that. Like, if you have the ability, you want to dictate play. So th that's kind of where the concept's coming from is like, how do we dictate play? The way that we found to do that is skating forward more often. Uh, surfing is, is more of, I believe, a Daryl term. I've only really uh, heard that around him but I, I know a lot of uh coaches are talking about that and when i was down in naples with the i think it's the american hockey coaches association meeting um there's a few coaches uh i think it was compen who was doing the defense for the jets uh he was talking about what they called swing ins but basically a similar idea they start very close and tight in the middle of the ice um, and as that winger comes up it allows their defensemen to swing out or swing into the play to cut that play off at the boards, hopefully before the red line or the blue line. So they're forcing icings and dump ins. Yeah, so it, it's definitely not all over the place quite yet, but it's it's going to be more and more prevalent in the top coaches that I'm seeing are, are the ones doing it. Yeah, that, that's a pretty pretty good uh, description, Greg. I think. I mean, in a, in a nutshell, what, whatever it is you want to call it, surfing, swinging in. Um, 
angling up, angling. Uh, it's all the same, and it's and it's about denying time and space to the offense, right. which is the primary role of the defensive group. Um, but it is, I think, important, at least from my perspective, because we're we actively encourage it with our Danish girls as well, uh, and practice it and teach it. And it is like any other tactic in hockey, situational. It's not something you can or must or should do in every situation. It's situational. And you, you um, even just having said that, you obviously learn uh, to manipulate your skating as a D to have good gap control, to defend a one-on-one. -on -one. And the, in, from the same perspective, it's important that you learn how to manipulate your skating so that you're in a position to surf or swing in or angle as much as you can. But it's still a situational thing. And there was a tremendous example in that same gold medal game at the World Championship with six minutes left in the third period where I normally, and I love Renata Fast as a player, and if I could have one defenseman from any team, I would take Renata. Um, she made a poor decision to surf in the neutral zone at the offensive blue line. And we gave up a breakaway with uh, six minutes left in that gold medal game. And if not for a awesome back check by Emily Clark and a literally a one handed reach and a lift of the stick to deny yeah. the shot, that game could have been over with six minutes left in the game. So it's a situational thing. Um, players have to learn how to use it, manipulate it um, to their advantage and learn equally as important when not to do it. Go ahead, Wally. Yeah, uh, exactly the point on Renata. I don't recall. I vaguely recall that, her doing it. <clears throat> but what I take out of you, what you said is it, I, I'm wondering if Troy heard of surfing when he talked to Daryl on the plane, so they introduced it. I think he heard of it long before that. Well, well I don't know. I, that, yeah, hey, Wally, I, I, Wally, I think, I think so. we're, do, we're using new catchwords here all the time that are the same thing. It's like we used to always talk about back checking. Now, now it's tracking back. We talked about denying the pass or denying a shot. Now it's surfing. It, it's catchwords to me. A lot well, of this stuff is the same. It's no, read no, the it, act and, uh, and here's where and I come play from. Play the situation. I'm a vocabulary guy. I'm a keyword guy. Right. And my level of thinking, which is pretty much the same as everybody here, I'm not. I've debated surfing and the idea of transition skating and playing rushes. I think that's gone the way of the dodo bird. And if the national team has just been introducing it to a degree. I can see where these kind of decisions aren't easy, but when I saw the American League prospects game, everybody challenged in the neutral zone. I never saw a rush being played with any backward striding. They were all forcing the play, forcing the play, forcing the play. And um, to that, and we watched Ella. We used to talk about pinching Greg, to pinch or not to pinch. Well, Ella is a defender who surfs to the goal line. So it's pinching to the goal line, but angling to deny that breakout pass to the winger. So the whole depth of the players, the game is changing to one, two, three, four, five from two, three. It, it interchanges and the D are up on the play. There is no contain, Tim. I was going to ask you this. In the curriculum, I put up the word, the, the phrase, playing defense is knowing when and how to pressure and when and how to contain. I might take out the when and how to contain now after being at this camp. So I don't know if that helps you guys or not, but I think. I'd love to talk to Troy and say, has he heard of it before? Has he tried to apply it before? Did he just try to apply it during this uh, centralization camp with him after his conversation with Daryl? I don't know. I, but, I would be 
I would be extremely surprised if he wasn't familiar with it um, long before his conversation with Daryl, but we don't know. Um, and I, I would, um, I, I, again, I, I would caution that I wouldn't take knowing how to contain out of any curriculum, because I think it still is a critical part of being a really good defender. Um, there, there's an, another great example in that gold medal game, I think in the, it was in the three on three overtime, where, uh, and it's one of, and again, Joss LaRock is a tremendous player. Uh, I want her on my team, but a situation where she was in a one on one and she needed to contain, but she was overly aggressive. And you can argue on the one side, it didn't quite work out for the U.S. player. But if it had worked out for the U.S. player, it's breakaway from the circle top in. So it's still, for me, a situational thing. And containing is still a very important mental uh, tool and concept for all defending players to understand. And, you know, sort of your point on Ella, uh, Wall, like, um, you know, and again, to my point, it's situational. She made a lot of really good reads to, to do what Daryl calls discourage the, the outlet pass and, uh, you know, surfed up to deny the outlet to the winger. She also made a bunch of really poor decisions trying to do the same thing where she gave up two on ones. So it's a situational thing. It's a great tool for the toolbox. But like everything else in hockey, it's not, you always got to do this. It's not a black and white thing. Yeah. It's a why, uh, why did she give up two on ones? Because she made the wrong, the wrong, yeah, like a week. Wally, she overcommitted herself in a situation that she shouldn't have overcommitted herself. Okay, here's, this is my point. She enters the Canada camp. They haven't played the way Daryl's coached her to play. They were encouraged by that staff to be very aggressive. So if they haven't been a team coaching that way, bringing the forwards up, there's no reading involved here. They're up there, the high forward, the D, having played that way together. If they played together, the forward should be there. And it's yeah. not a case of reading. But it, is, well, it, just, it is. I disagree the game with is you reading. Well. I think you have it, to read, and you cannot is. go in there if you don't have support. Exactly, Bob. Exactly. The game is reading. I mean, if she they, might know what she's doing, but she's got to have support, and if she doesn't have support, she can't do it. I absolutely. thought defensively in her well, own I, zone, I, I, I know what you're saying. She chased. That's, yeah, that's old school. She was chasing from behind that's through the corners. Well, like She's got to contain. She can't. Just yeah. because she wants to go doesn't mean that she can go. Absolutely. I, don't, I don't know if anybody else, Greg, I don't know if you get what I'm trying to say. I'm just saying the way the game's going, defense are being taught to play this way, and she's being taught to step up to the goal line, and the forwards will naturally be back is what I think happens. I don't know that they're making decisions because it's happening so quickly. And when I saw that three-on-two played that way in that drill, they never gave up a breakaway or an outnumbered rush. So I'm not saying don't teach it. Definitely. You've got to teach it, but it's how you coach it that determines how they play it, whether they read and react. And they're going to be acting more aggressively as a unit of five in the well, way I, we play. I agree with, I agree with being aggressive on the puck, Wally, but you, you can't be reckless either. Like, like you have to be able to read what's going on around you. You've got, you've got four other skaters on the ice with you and a goaltender, and everybody has to be on the same page. You can't go indiscriminately running after somebody because that's what you want to do. You cannot put your teammate in a perilous <coughs> position. It, you've got to use some caution. I mean, if you've got people in support position, by all means, you go without, without question. You always want to deny passes or deny shots or take away lanes, like all of those things are there, but you can't do it if you don't have support. And, and 
I think that's where the Toronto Maple Leafs get themselves in a lot of trouble last year, where they gave up a lot of odd man rushes because they were caught out of position without support. I totally agree, Bob. And, um, you know, we, we don't know. I, I, I'm going to concede to you, Wally, uh, this point that, you know, number one, we don't know what kind of structure they were encouraging the girls to have or not have at the development camp that Ella took place in. Uh, likely very loose sort of structure. Um, if your team is structured such that there is an expectation that A, the defense, we want them to surf in and discourage as much as they possibly can. If there's at that expectation uh, within the structure of your team, then there's a concomitant expectation from the forwards that there needs to be a serious reload of the back checking or transitioning forwards. And when that's in place, we, I think we all agree that that can be very, very effective. But it's still beholding to the defenseman to recognize, man, there are going to be situations where maybe the forward fell down. One forward chased behind the net. Another forward is trying to pressure the D to D. Maybe the forward fell down. Maybe she's late. Maybe the offensive, two offensive players are above that forward. It's still beholden on that defenseman to read and react appropriately. And it's like, whoop, I can't go. You might start to go, but you have to read, whoop, not a good time. I got to get out. And Ella made a couple of poor decisions. Not so much in the offensive zone, but in the neutral zone with respect to that. Yeah. And that's where, you know, yeah. people would come to a question. Yeah. Okay, but, uh, Bob and Tim, have either of you listened to her review of her eight shifts explaining what she saw and why she did what she did? Well, Wally, I, I went over that clip that you sent out. Yeah. And I went over it and I wrote down everything that I saw with the exception of a couple of things that I didn't think Was that about. one clip or eight clips? It was one clip. That's the only one I okay. saw. It was about okay. a minute and a half shift or maybe under that. I'm not sure. Yeah. And uh, it, and I, th I think that she honestly saw or, and thought what was going on the ice at, in real time. And then afterwards when I did my review and I'd sent it to you, then I watched her review. And she was pretty much right on with everything she said, um, what she was thinking. Yeah. There's a couple of little things that I might have thought a little bit different if it was me playing. Yeah. But for her, what she's being taught and what she was reading, yeah. I, was, I was okay with. I thought she got herself in, as I wrote in there, that she got herself in some bad positions by turning her ass to the wall and letting the guy sneak out yeah. the middle or the girl sneak out the middle on her. She kind of, when she surfed, she surfed too wide sometimes and took herself out of the play, which a lot no. of plays, which didn't happen, but plays could have come up the middle. It did happen on the one uh, play, but I think it was a line change by her partner, which she didn't recognize, and that caused the problem. But, like, I think she's very intelligent and, and knowing what she no. wants to do, but she can't do what she wants to do if her teammates aren't in concert with her. That, that's my... That well, the, the job of the coach is making sure they're in concert. So she's playing Daryl's game. That's her job a, too, though, Wally. You know, well, if, just if, play. If her support I, 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 aren't I there, she can't make a wrong decision because she's, she's, because trying, she's doing, she's trying she's doing the right thing. Minute. She has to adapt her game to the team. And like you said, she's a rover. She played like a rover. If you yes. have uh, I'll I may send the eight clips to her. If you listen to her explain the clips, I don't think I couldn't. I never saw 90% of what she saw and never thought anybody would think as quickly in real time being on the ice playing that game. So that, that tells me when you say teach, read, and react, I think when you coach them and they're raised that way, yeah, they do surf to the outside, and she identified that. She has to surf to the inside sometimes. But that denying on the outside and the pressuring of surfing is inside out, she talked about it. So she, 
she knows about it. But I'm just saying if if you're coached that way and the Leafs seem to be, and I'm glad you brought it up, Bob, the Leafs seem to be giving up outnumbered rushes. It may be a product of that disconnect between the defense and forwards and the forwards hesitate, the defense hesitating at surfing so deep, hesitating at joining attack. And I think that's, that point you made is really, that's a good one. And I'm going to edit this part of, of it for Daryl specifically, because excellent, excellent feedback. Craig, what do you think? We're going uh, to- I- I think we're looking at check attachment, right? Like we're trying to contain speed before it gets going. So I think the tactic is good, but yeah, same thing that, that you guys were talking about. Like you need to be able to do it into the middle. Uh, you need to be able to read not just your player, but maybe there's speed behind you or behind, not so much behind you, but behind uh, your check. And like, that's the real threat would be the speed coming through off that second layer. It's the same thing as when you have an anchor forward coming out to push back the defense that's not realistically the true threat the true threat's going to be the speed coming up through the play that'll catch you get you caught flat-footed or a, a bad speed differential um, but I, I do love the concept that he's teaching her of the check attachment attach early discourage passes already be there so you can make plays immediately um, and just play a, a very aggressive style Makes sense. Thank you, Craig. I, pr- I really appreciate that. Yeah, I, I think she's very well schooled in, in what Daryl wants her to do. Uh, I have no question about that. But if you watch Tampa Bay, where did they break the puck out most of the time in the playoffs? They used a little pop up the middle and out they come. If that defenseman is going to be surfing to the wall like that all the time to deny that winner pass, they're coming out the middle on you every time. So you can't be doing that every time. You've got to You've got to show it sometimes, do it sometimes, not do it sometimes. You, you've got to keep the other the other guy off balance too. And Tampa just popped the puck up the middle time after time after time after time when when the opposition was trying to take away their their D to D to wing pass. They, they recognize what what the opposition was doing. So I, I, I believe you're able to I surf. Think that's a tactic you can use 100 percent of the time. Go ahead, Greg. It's- it's definitely a tactic, but I think the idea here is we want to take away the middle option, leave that wall open, and then surf into it if you're talking about on like a breakout like that. So sure. you're not going to surf down to the wall. You're going to surf down to the middle, take that option away until they get it to the wall, and then you'll go there. Um, at that point, obviously, you, you got to know you've got some like center support or some support there, but it wouldn't be just to go straight down to the wall. It would be middle out. I don't know. What are you guys thinking? The same thing? Like you got to hold it until it's there, and, it, and they actually make the pass, because otherwise you're, you're going to get burned all the time through well, the middle. Well, Daryl's well, trying to actually discourage the pass. He's yeah. wanting it to be. He wants, with his daughter at least. I, I don't know what what they're teaching with the Maple Leafs, but what I saw, and maybe I'm not reading it right, he wants her to go right down there, and so there is absolutely no chance to make a play there. Discourage the pass and make them go somewhere else, like whether it's back D to D or up the middle or. Reverse it, whatever, whatever. And I just don't feel that you can do it every time like that because the other, the opposition is going to read that, and I think there's got too many options. Yeah, and that's exactly the term that Daryl uses, discouraging. And I agree with you, Bob. That's what he wants. And I also agree, as I said already, it's a tool, it's a tactic, but it has to fit in the, um, not just the structure of, of your game, so that everybody understands that. Uh, it also still is, as we said before, if I'm that D hoping to go up and discourage, I got to have uh, an idea of what's going on through the middle of the rink. Because yeah. if uh, it's not a good situation, then you got to bail out. It's situational. Uh, it's a great tool to use. It's actively coached and it's something um, new in the game. Um, we didn't do a lot of it back in our day, especially coming off the offensive blue line. Uh, in fact, I showed that uh, a couple of months ago, I showed that one clip back in the old Hartford Whaler days where it, it was Joel Quenville and Ulf Samuelson. And it was a perfect situation where Joel should have surfed across and denied the breakout. But he didn't because it simply wasn't a tactic back in the day. He had back-checking support, 
it was it's a classic perfect example of how the game has changed and in some ways in a good way it's a high pressure game it's a turnover game it's good for the defense but it's also good for the offense when you don't deploy that tactic intelligently as a defensive unit um like in Renata's case and again I love Renata she's on my yeah. team a hundred times rebound. all the time uh both personality wise and, and as a player but it was not the right time for her to surf across. Greg, you no, got it wasn't. There. And she I actually you were got herself too deep too. Even on the surf, she 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 was coming across and she got too deep. She misjudged the that forward speed and got behind him. Mm -hmm. Or her, I should say. And then it was an absolute breakaway. See see to me, if you're if you're gonna keep surfing that wing and deny and discouraging that pass, I think you're gonna slash your back backside winger right through the middle. And have your stamina curl up the other side, and you've got all kinds of options coming up the other side of the ice. Because we slash that winger across, then her partner's got to go with that, and you've cleared the whole other side of the ice. And then you've got to be really careful. You yeah. better your your other four skaters out there better know exactly what everybody's doing, and there better be support, or you're going to get burnt a lot. Sorry, Wally. I think that good point there, uh, Bob, because hockey is a, a mix, it's mix so of fluid. It's read and, read and react, and yeah. you do this, I do that. What what do you got there, Greg? Oh, your mic's your mic's off. Greg, can you share your screen? Oh, your mic's um, off. Because because I was I saw you playing with it, and that's why I want to put my hand up. Share your screen, buddy, so we can see it. <laughs> yeah, one second. I actually have it on my iPad, so let me uh, actually pull it up on my computer here. Okay. And what what is it? You can just sort of lead us into it as you're doing that. Yeah, so um, Daryl has a $20 a month uh, subscription you can sign up for. Uh, it calls it the Bell Free Hockey Platform. So uh, kind of what we're leading into here, he's actually talked about and has a clip exactly on that. So feel free, feel free to keep the sessions going while I, I pull this up on my computer okay. and I'll, I'll share my screen. Yeah, Tim, I, I'm sort of being the devil's advocate with both you and Bob on this. It The, the game is changing. I'm not sure, you know, like, has Troy heard of this? How much does he apply it? Is it the way the game is now? Uh, my fear, and that's from ages ago, is we couldn't skate backwards against the Russians. We couldn't transition skate. We had to teach it at practice before we played any games in Europe, and they felt comfortable on big ice, coping with the speed of the Russians. Now the game is uh, they skate forward more often than backwards. Um, I think defensemen have lost the ability to transition efficiently and stride backwards to play rushes, but you can never forget about those things and the importance of contained skating. Because playing without the puck is now, as Daryl said, dictating the play, getting them to go where you want to with as little time as possible. And so you're proactively playing defense more and not reactively controlling the gap so that you can keep them on the defensive side or on the outside. So I think this is... The game is going there, and I think everybody, you may be right, Troy's heard of it, everybody's onto it, it's not a big deal anymore. For me, it is a big deal, but Bob, the point you made about what are the Leafs doing, what is that coaching staff doing, well, I think, I'm, I know that Daryl's having conversations and working with those coaches now, and uh, that's, that is an issue the ability of the defense to, to be able to contribute more in terms of pressuring w without giving up outnumbered rushes. So not sure they're there yet because they maybe have been brought up differently. I don't know. But well, Wally, I've always coached too. When you're on the offensive attack, you still have some defensive responsibilities, right? You can't just have a five-man rush all the time. There has to be a defensive conscious consciousness as to what happens when the puck moves from player to player who 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 does have a defensive responsibility on the wide side or the middle or 
or whatever. So I find that with the Leafs, they're so offensively minded, yeah. most of their players, that they're leaving their defensemen in, in perilous positions sometimes. When the puck, you know, on a, like even on a on a shot on net that they go far corner, it rims out, and there they are, they're chasing. Right? They, yeah. To me, they, and they've got some unbelievably gifted offensive players. Like Matthews and Marner are as good as there is. Right? But there's Whoever is on that, whoever on that line, better have a real good defensive conscience, or they're going to be in big trouble. I think that's where Hyman was good for them. Yeah, he'll be good in Edmonton with the guys he's going to play with there, just because of that. All right, let me uh, figure out how to share my screen real quick. I know I can do this. Tim, do, do we have to give permission to share? I don't no? think so. It okay. should be down in the. Uh, the bottom bottom right, maybe, uh, Greg. There's a little three little dots that says more. Okay, you might share it. screen. Um, love that one. All right. Let me know oh. whenever you can see it. It looks like it clicked. We just got a. I got black right now, but it looks like it, there, there you go. Yep. Okay, so let me find the exact clip I'm looking for here. You well, can kind I've of see the drawings. That... All I've got's black. What do I need to do here? Hmm. That's interesting. I see it. I'm yeah, I see it too. You guys. Bob hasn't paid his fee to Wally. His monthly <laughs> fee. It must be. There's no charge, but. Yeah, I'm just trying to find the exact clip I was I was actually seeing over here. But um let's see if I can play it out. Sometimes my computer computer does not like to cooperate. Yeah, and we've had trouble before with playing video on Skype. It's not that user friendly. It skips and jumps a lot. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm I know I know I can do Zoom well, but uh Skype's yeah. relatively uh, on the newer end for me here, but See if Bob, I get it you to... want to log out and log in again? I can. I'll try it. Okay. Right about there. Okay. Okay, so I'll stop it uh, right at this point. So you can see how um, it, if Bob the, gets back on, we, we'll redo it because I really well I just oh, there wait. he is, there he is. Yeah. Yep, I got it now. Good. All right. All, All right, right, Wally. Wally, you just helped somebody with a tech issue. Huh. <laughs> Love yeah. to see that. <laughs> yeah. Plug so it in. plug it in. Yeah, similar to what we talked about, you can see uh, in the middle here, I know it's kind of grainy, uh, but you can see Ella's in the white, you can see her sticks on the left side, and the idea is discouraging the middle and then attacking the outside. So taking that away. Obviously, when you put this into team play, you know, it's going to be very situational of how you do it and where your teammates are. Uh, but the general concept is to basically surf down, middle out, discourage the one, play... Ah, uh, jeez. Where was I? Okay. So basically discouraging this play from going to the inside, waiting on it, not going too early to the outside to make sure the defenseman reads that, okay, I need to pass to the outside because the middle's taken away. And when they do that, then you can jump to the wall. Especially given the fact that the wall player is usually relatively stationary. You know, sometimes they're posted up there or they haven't gotten their feet moving up the ice quite yet. So you really don't need to attack it too early. So I know that's a general concept that they're, they're working on. Any can, thoughts? I make, can I make a point here? Bob, what you said about far side rims, that's the out. Mm -hmm. That's the out. And then that's the outnumbered play because um, there is no F3 or high support for a far side rim. Um, and I think you have to be cognizant of the team, if you're coaching, of teams that are taking advantage of that over-aggressiveness. 
and more about all the players on the strong side not recovering back to that makes absolute sense. There's a strength, but there's a weakness here that you can coach successfully I'll, I'll, against. Yeah, I'll take the I'll take the far side rim over a direct pass to the winger every time if you yeah. can force him into that. Okay. Yeah, agreed. But uh, you know when when we talked to Daryl. And uh, when he was working with Ella here at Father Bauer, um, like if if I'm Ella in that situation, I'm not going in there. If there's somebody that I have to worry about in the middle, unless I know that I've got, as you pointed out, Greg, unless I know I've got uh, speed coming back in support of what would be Ella's uh, you know, surf up there or or uh, whatever you want to call it. If she doesn't have that uh, support, then she shouldn't be going in there trying to play that two-on-one in my situ- in, in, from my perspective. No, I, I agree with that. I think that you want to keep tight with your D pairs these days. I think that's kind of, I don't know if, if you've seen that at all, but that's something I've seen out there is a lot more coaches want their D pairs to be extremely tight together. Uh, and and do the surfing together and do everything kind of in pairs. So I think that's something important to note as well is if you're not taking away these passing options, you're pretty close to your D partner and being able to support uh, strong with them. That's pretty good. I'll have to look into Daryl's. Um, is, is it a monthly thing for his... Um... Yeah, it's a monthly uh, thing. So if you go to yeah. belfryhockey.com, it's 20 bucks a month. Yeah, I used to, I've, I've got a lot of his, uh, his old instructional videos and stuff, but I might have to log on to that, just get some some uh, developmental ideas. Is that the old uh, pro playmakers? Yeah, yeah. Classics. You, you can't find those anywhere. Well, I know, like they're, uh, when I first met Daryl, that uh, would be, oof. Getting close to nine years ago now, I think. Uh, we were at the U-22 camp in 2012. Or, yeah, I think so. Might have been 11 even. But, uh, yeah, and then so uh, searched around for a lot of his old videos and stuff. Really good. Really good stuff. I got a, a question, Greg. <clears throat> and it's sort of like I'm talking Daryl's influence on the best players buying in because they are getting better. And uh, when Daryl first worked with the national team, he attempted s- some methodology one-on-one with Poulon that didn't work out as well. But when it working out with the elite players, it's not the same as working out with an average player. Now, Poulon isn't an average player female player she's an elite female player but the ability to communicate with females he mentioned how he would approach it differently for them to try the concepts and right right now I'm the best players are influenced in supporting Daryl because of the success they have with it and if you were to do this these kinds of things with the female team, uh, I think they would be pretty, pretty effective. But it looks simple to me that that far side rim, as Bob mentioned, it's a gimme, and you would take away that surf tactic for sure. But if you want to rim it, we'll let you rim it. Those, those are not fun oh. pucks to pick up. <laughs> No, no, and somebody will be jamming down your throat. There's no problem there from my perspective. Yeah, no, I agree with you, Tim. That, that's one of uh, Daryl's objectives is yeah. to make instead yeah, of but what them, about, make what about the counter pitch? The forward goes out and plays by the D, stays high. So like a, a two three, is that what you're saying? No, the the low winger just on the far side. Counter pitches, they go up and stand beside the defender who isn't even there. 
So you're saying kind of a rotation, the strong side defenseman pinches, the, the weak side defenseman slides, and that back side def- uh, forward well, that's slides back, and it's like the weak side defenseman? In the female curriculum, we advocate the far side or the weak side defenseman pinches and F3 supports. And I had this conversation years ago with uh, Kitchen, the coach at, uh, down in Florida, when Thomas took me there, he was doing skill work with them. They gave up two on ones all night. And I asked them the next day if they had any strategy of pinching or not pinching. Did they have a read pinch? Did they do it pinch far side only? Is that a rule? Um, did they call pinch off because they were ahead or whatever? And there was too much decision making going on. Hi, honey. That was my opinion. In that I'm just doing some work, emailing these places back. Nice. So I'm coming from that old school and uh, thinking, okay, like the game's going to go through a bit of an evolution here for the next few years. And this is definitely important to talk about. And Greg, I have to admit you're, you're bringing in Daryl's languaging, making it meaningful, understandable. It's simpler. Um, I don't think you had to read his book four times, but I've had to read it four times and I still am reading it, trying to figure it out. But well, Wally, what, what you were just talking about there, that, that's the nuance in the coaching and the, and the decision making. Like, you know, we all love to talk about leave the decision making to the players and they have to, of course, make decisions in the moment. But there's a nuance in terms of what you're saying, because um, I think what one of the things you were saying is there was no direction from the, the Florida staff on, you know, what sort of plan A was. Um, and so it's not always the players make all the decisions and it's not the coaches give all the hard and fast direct rules. There's a, there's a back and forth there. There's got to be some principles or guidelines to some organization, as Peter Smith likes to say, or structure, um, that it's still a read and react game. And the all these phones ringing so it's still it, it's a back and forth like there's decision making and there's principles guidelines organization structure whatever and it's the meeting of the minds that is the beauty of coaching um and when you you have a meeting of the minds then you usually have a pretty effective team i think and greg just so you know i, I muted you when your wife jumped on there too so you have to unmute yourself and same as Wally. I have oh, yeah, I thought I muted myself. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, um, I, I'm going to probably have to jump off here as well and uh, go live the rest of my life. Um, much as we, we uh, love doing this. Uh, it's been, it's been Greg, uh, it's been good and refreshing to have you on. So I hope you can get on in future weeks whenever you have the time. I think it's easy to join any week when you um when you see us on here so for sure feel free to jump on appreciate that i'm actually i'm going to um so i did a presentation on angling that i want to pass along and get your guys opinion of because i think it might be interesting sure um, so angling I'll, I'll, or I'll, surfing I, I i call it it's a presentation that i i give um i've given a few times and i and i agree with you bob and kind of your point about um like that Obviously, angling has been around forever, but, but I think it's true that the game has certainly gone in a different direction with respect to the defenseman, uh, for sure in the offensive zone, in the neutral zone. But even for me, the you know I really actively encourage our D to, when you're gapping up out of the D zone, or if you're coming off the bench on a change and the the plays coming down the far side. Those are two great situations to angle, not default to skating in front of the play, turning backwards and accepting the rush. Like when you're gapping up out of the defensive zone, sometimes 
you're in a real good position to just angle and finish. You're coming right. off the bench and coming across the ice. Instead of just turning around backwards and giving that forward time and space, you're in a perfect position to angle and finish. And so angling has been around forever, but it's really, really pronounced skill now for defensemen to use, use, uh, learn to use to deploy. And I think that's kind of the subtle difference here. It's, like you say, it's got different names. But um, I'm curious from an offensive standpoint, how do you counteract angling? That's, that's what gets my curiosity going, because I feel like it's becoming more and more used. So how do we counteract it? And that was the root of my question to Wally before. I wonder, and I don't know, if Toronto chose to do that drill more, or maybe not more, or chiefly to help the forwards figure out how to beat it than to teach the defense how to do it. And they could obviously get both out of it, perhaps. But that's that was the root of my question. Um, what was their focus there? And we don't know the answer to that. But no. I'm going to investigate that with Daryl yeah. at some point. So good. Then my, my thought, my thought on that was that exactly that: is that they were forcing the forwards to react to that pressure coming up on them, and how were they going to play against it? That's what I was thinking the drill was for: that the, yeah. def, the defensive players were told purposely to go up and fa and and deny that or surf so that the forwards had to react to what they were doing that's what i yeah. really thought it was much like the much like the badger bob power play drill where you got two people chasing you know just yeah. chase 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 force the offensive people to like the europeans love to say and i love the the terminology find the solution to the problem you're confronted with an angling defenseman how do, how do you beat that? Like, so I, I totally agree, and I I'm thinking they they're getting both out of it, but that's yeah. why I asked the question, and I'll try to get the answer from Daryl. So a great question there, uh, Greg and Wally. You're you're muted. I muted you when uh, your phone rang. So you know, go ahead. You'll have to unmute yourself. There you go, Greg. My answer to your question is, players. If a player asks that question, oh boy. Kudos. Let's talk about it. Let's discuss options and a solution. So my philosophy from the get-go was figure it out. Now this well, is Wally. this this is something that requires help. But FIO simply many years ago, this became that's not the way hockey's been coached. <coughs> it's been told because I said dump it in, dump it out. I always do this, I always do That's the way they've been reared. So philosophically, going from yelling to telling to asking, I'm just talking about respectful communication. I, I wasn't capable of asking that question to see if that was his purpose of the drill. You know, I'm, I'm not there. I didn't think about it. I just saw pressure. And in my mind, those players are looking at ways to create and be comfortable with pressure. And they haven't, in my mind, haven't reached the stage of dealing with that pressure because right now they're looking at offensive pressure in an attack drill by the defenders. That was the purpose of the drill, not well, success in getting an attack. But I don't know. I, I'm love to have the time and I don't I don't know that I could ever get the time, but boy, I don't even know if Daryl would talk about that drill and, you know, talk. he would love to talk about the coach about that, I think. And he could talk to Sheldon, but where are they at relative to communication with the American League staff and the other staff? It's evolving. Oh, it's I'm going to follow up with Daryl. I'm sure he would have something to say about what they were thinking about in terms of a purpose for that drill. Yeah. Uh, but Tom, Tom wanted in here. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, I, I think that how you how you compensate for that pressure is is the way the low forward now plays it low and slow, and they're coming up from underneath, so you can touch it back or jackhammer back to the D, and uh, you know, and with the wide player cutting across, you know, you can you can also chip it out. So you know, I think that that's how you you handle that when the guys. 
Like, especially on a rim, you're going to surf on a rim, right? And get the guy angled right there. But, you know, if they pass below you, then uh, you can get it out that way. So that's how I think that uh, teams have compensated for that extra pressure. Because it used to be the low guy went kind of the top quarter of the circle towards the blue line. That was the angle that the center would take on the breakouts. But now they're going almost through the goal crease for that like 10 foot pass. So that's uh, how I think it's how you beat that stuff. The different different ways to counter punch. And of course the other the other way you can you you can counter try to counteract it is if if you know that the D are going to be surfing down and and discouraging on that winger get out of the zone. Just tell right. that winger get the heck out of there as soon as you see the puck coming towards your side. Get out of the zone, create space over there, uh, force the forechecking defenseman to react to you. There's lots of ways to sort of counteract it. Um, yeah, there's yeah. a lot more of that now. They fly in the zone, and the wide winger is going to the far opposite blue line a lot of the times. Yeah, That's right. but if you're, if you're organized uh, in terms of your checking schemes, you still have answers back to that as well. It's, that's what the game is all about in some ways. Greg, uh, any questions or any more answers, ideas yourself? Uh, so in, in the um, presentation, I actually give an idea of how to counteract uh, some parts of the angling, uh, especially when someone's coming directly at you or trying to angle you into the wall. Um, but it's it's a t I mean, it's a tough tactic to, to get around if you're in, say, your defensive structure, you finally get a puck and you're starting to get moving. Uh, I think we did hit on one. I mean, something I tell my guys, uh, strong side wingers need to get out of the zone because you're just clogging up the rest of it. Um, yeah, I, I guess my question to, to everyone else would be, what kind of tactics are we seeing more often with that weak side winger to provide support for the puck carrier that's getting angled? The slash is the big thing now, just oh, slash right, right through the middle with a with a purpose to get to that far blue line so you're available, like Wally said, or for Tom said, for chips out or pucks off the glass to create foot races. Like that's been pretty prevalent in the NHL game for the last eight or ten years as well. That weak side winger slash is the big way to uh, help counteract it. Anyway, just before I forget to, uh, Greg, did you, did you, um, you mentioned a presentation on angling? Yeah, I threw it in the, uh, the Skype chat right here. And if you go okay. to YouTube yeah. and just yeah. search my name, angling, uh, it'll come right up. Okay. That was, I saw it in the, the YouTube link and I, that's, I wondered if that's what it was. I'll have a look at that later on. Thanks. Yeah. Quick half hour. Yeah. Good. Guys, I got, I got to exit here. Okay. Yeah. okay. See you, Bob, and good luck with your son. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good rest of your chat. Have a good week. Yeah. Oh, good. Take care, Bob. Take and care. I got a, I got to exit as well. I, um, yeah, yeah. Me too. We're we're just about two hours and thirty eight. Bad. What do you think of it, Greg? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of yeah. fun. A lot of fun. But yeah, we'll we'll have to can this for the uh, for next week. Well, and you know, before we go, I I put two videos of Stacy teaching my girls skating and uh, put them put them up. Uh, she did a really good job. Did you share them on this Skype? I'll see if I can figure out how. Yeah. yeah John, what, 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 kind of, what kind of skating stuff was she doing? Was it forward, backward, starting, stopping, crossovers, or what? Or a little everything? Well, uh, most of the forward stuff and striding so far. Next session is skating backwards. But uh, she was going to do that last night, and then I got – Seda's made it so difficult that everybody's got to get this police check, and she sent her thing in, and the police say, well, your photo isn't clear enough, so you got to do it again. So she couldn't come on the ice last night. Mm -hmm. So anyway, she didn't do it. She'll do it in two weeks. But, yeah, it was a lot of striding, a lot of, you know, uh, getting down. And I don't know, she does, she does a lot of very neat exercises. Yeah. So – different things yeah good cool not to have a look anyway i gotta run guys um okay. thanks for that link greg and hope we see you again sometime 
Yeah, absolutely. Take care, guys. Take care. Great. Thank you very much. Hey, Wally, uh, FYI, uh, you know, the uh, Flames Midget Girls AAA tournament is on this weekend. Is it canceled? No, uh, it's on. Well, it's on. I, I just got an email saying they're going full out. Yeah. I'm, I'm going, I'm going to a game tonight. I'm scouting a girl who's from Florida. Her, she's asked me to come and do a, do a little evaluation of her. This is set up through Alan Andrews. Uh, she's playing at Kelowna at their uh, the program that uh, POE. Yeah, sort of a POE. It's a different name now, but yeah. I'm I'm gonna. She played this morning against the Edmonton Pandas, which was a good team. And uh, I'm you know I'm just looking forward to getting in the rink and seeing her play and talking to a young person. Listen, well, look, look, for, my, look for it. Look for Harry there, Wally. He's he, I think he's going to be in town. Harry Rosenholz. Oh, good. Good. I'll, I'll definitely and look, look I might up. try to get out to a game or two as well. But Look, thanks for everything. I, I'm i really glad Greg got on. I might get him to do a podcast with us and uh, lead it and edit it for himself because he gets his podcast, the one he did with me, you know, like the guy is... He's in touch with a lot of people in the States and uh, he's, he's had about 30 podcasts and the level of thinking he's Belfry ish for sure. He may be one of the guys that has worked for Belfry before that Daryl described in his book is the people that aren't intimidated by different information. Mm. And that's, that's what I think, uh, you know, it's, you just don't want to be intimidated with information. You want to understand it and apply it. And I uh, thank goodness of my age, I'm getting to understand a little bit more here. So thanks very much, everybody. Okay. Thanks, Wally. See yeah. you, Tom. See you, Tom. Yeah, see, I'm sending you guys that link because I don't know how to put it on Skype. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay. I'll forward it to uh, to, to uh, Craig. Okay. Okay. Uh, see you guys. Bye-bye.